I would like to start this first event of our lecture series, Scientific Questions Then and Now, with a very warm welcome from all three of us organizers. Alexander Blum, Research Group Leader at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, Michael Chase, Senior Researcher at the SUNRS, and myself, also Research Group Leader at the MPIWG. This welcome extends to everyone in the audience, but it especially extends to the four speakers for this evening. Professor Carlo Rovelli from Ex Marseille University, Professor Ricardo Chiaradonna from Università Roma 3, Professor Gottfried Heinemann from the University of Kassel and Professor Peter Adamson from the LMU in Munich. It is a tremendous honor and a great pleasure for all of us to welcome you as the first and dare I say, pioneering speakers of this lecture series. Later, it will be our pleasure to introduce you on your exciting and thought-provoking work in much greater detail. For now, I wish to turn to those people who remain mostly invisible, truly, because they've turned their cameras off, um, but who are the irreplaceable force behind the practical aspects of this event. In the name of all the organizers, let me thank of the IT team of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science with especially heartfelt thanks to Anina Wojcznik, the digital content curator of my re research group, Chaonan Zhang, the assistant of my group, Xenia Marchensky, the assistant of Alex Bloom's group, and Emily Filippi, the student assistant of my research group. Without their energy and good spirits, this event would not have been possible. Please, therefore, join us in thanking them for their excellent work. Now, let me add a special word of thanks to my two co-hosts, Alex and Mike, for the many, many hours of inspiring discussion that we spent conceiving this project. And I'm very much looking forward to all the ones to come. It won't be an exaggeration to say, uh, there's one question that has brought us all here tonight. What is science? Many of the greatest minds throughout history have given answers to that question, and I'm sure we will touch on some of them tonight. So I leave the answers for later and think instead about the ways in which such a response can be approached. In view of our topic today, I will restrict myself to uh, what has been considered the prime among the sciences, physics. In the paper we will discuss tonight, Aristotle's Physics, a physicist's look, Carlo Rovelli claims that Newtonian, I quote, physics provides an effective conceptual scheme for understanding phys physical phenomena, unquote, and that Aristotle's physics does so as well for its own domain. And this claim is impressively supported by Professor Rovelli's outstanding historical knowledge and mastery of contemporary physics. But the claim also has another value for my current concern. It proposes an answer to the question, what is science that focuses on a distinctive product, a theory. This approach matches the one that our three historians of philosophy have often taken in their own works. Aristotelian physics is a theory, perhaps in a slightly different sense of the word, but still it's a theory. As such, it aims to describe nature correctly and to predict certain physical phenomena. Now, as Professor Rovelli hints in his paper, some historians of science may find this way of answering our question disconcerting. In the past decades, various turns in the history of science have taken a considerably wider approach, encompassing practices, materials, and images. For them, science is a practice, and modern science is a practice in which technology plays just as significant a role as do humans and the products of their minds. Science and technology studies and historical epistemology, to name just two, have certainly opened our eyes to the complexities inherent in our question. But perhaps more than attention and approach, as Carlo Rovelli also notes, I see our event today as a chance to discuss what it is that connects pre-modern science and contemporary science. That is certainly theory, it's descriptive and predictive forces, but it is also practices, 
subtle or intangible as they may appear, for scientific practices include not only practices of experiment and observation, but also practices of the mind. The instruments that the human mind uses to produce the product of a theory may be the least visible to the historian. We cannot talk to Aristotle as a practicing scientist anymore. But we can't, what we can do is to take both Aristotle and Ravelli seriously when read in conjunction. They both point out that once the product of a theory exists, a theory that all practitioners know has its explanatory and predictive gaps, it is revisited again and again over, thanks to the voracious curiosity and perpetual desire of the human mind to know more and to know better. better. With these thoughts, I pass on to Alex's welcome address to you. Yes, thank you, and a, a warm welcome from me too. I'm not gonna keep you long, but I wanted to say a few words on that question that Katja brought up of what is science, and in doing so, also give you a bit of background on how this event came to be. Um, so if you stare too long at science, and historians and philosophers tend to do that, it gets blurry at the edges, and you start wondering if it really is a thing. So once in a while, you need to return to that question of what is science. Um, that goes for the history of science as a discipline, and it also goes for the individual historian. So I returned to that question some two years ago, distant pre-pandemic times, when I gave a colloquium talk here at the Institute, um, and trying to recapture what had made science special to me before I became a professional thinker about it, I ended up with these big questions, the big questions that science dares to tackle such as the one that our research group is devoted to, what is the world made of? Now, such big questions appear to transcend the ages, to transcend the different ways of acquiring knowledge or acquiring scientific knowledge, if you want, that humans have tried out over the course of history. It doesn't seem that modern physics is trying to answer the same questions that already occupied the pre-Socratics. But historians of science aren't so sure about that. Right? How deep can this apparent continuity really be? And would ancient philosophers admit the ideas of contemporary physics as answers to the questions that they were interested in? Or is the resemblance of those questions merely superficial? So um, Katya, Mike, and I figured that we should just try it out. Right? Bring together scientists and long-dead philosophers or the closest thing we have to long dead philosophers, that's historians of ancient and medieval philosophy, and then watch those communicate, really communicate that. So communicate about difficult matters with an aim for full understanding, and thus with a need for honest attempts at translation between disciplines. And that was our, our idea, and today's our first experiment in this regard. And I think we have a superb and highly promising lineup that will pull no punches and really engage with each other. Um, and as I said to Katya and Mike the other day, we'd rather, we'd rather have this whole thing fail spectacularly than be an anemic exchange of pleasantries and mutual respect, right? Um, and if we manage to do that, then maybe by the time that this is over, we'll have a somewhat clear idea of whether we've really always been after the same rainbow's end. And uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to our third organizer, who's also going to be um, introducing our first speaker, speaker. So please, Mike, take it away. Thank you, Alex, for your, your eloquent talk. And I, I echo um, all my colleagues' welcomes and greetings and thanks to the co-organizers. Now, we are certainly extremely fortunate to welcome uh, Carlo Rovelli to kick off our series of seminars. Carlo Rovelli is, of course, one of the world's leading physicists. He is professor at the Université Aix Marseille and one of the founders of Loop Quantum Gravity. I won't repeat his CV, uh, which covers 24 pages single-spaced, but I will mention that he's the author of over 270 scientific papers and of many best-selling books, such as Anaximander and His Legacy, Seven Brief Lex Lessons on Physics, Reality is Not What It Seems, The Order of Time, and most recently, The Wonderful Helgoland, Making Sense of the Quantum Revolution, which is certainly the best uh, and the best written introduction to quantum physics that I've ever read. Now, I want to stress a couple of points that uh, perhaps along with his tremendous productivity, literary talent and gift for explaining highly complex ideas in understandable form contribute to Carlo's uniqueness among contemporary scientists. The first is that like Heisenberg, he received an excellent classical education studying for five years at the Liceo Maffei in Verona 
So when he writes about classical Greek thinkers like Anaximander or, as this evening, Aristotle, he knows what he's talking about. Second, he's a representative of a breed that exists to some extent still in Europe, but has almost disappeared in North America, the public intellectual. He does not remain in his ivory tower, but speaks out on a wide variety of topics in Italian newspapers and other media, not just about science, but about politics, culture, and philosophy. And in this regard, I highly recommend a book of his that has recently appeared uh, in English translation. There are places in the world where rules are less important than kindness, published by Penguin in 2020. Now, Carlo is here to speak to us today about the continuing re relevance of Aristotelian physics, and I'm going to let him do all the talking about that. But just by way of an introduction, uh, both to Carlo's thought and to our speaking a speaker series on scientific questions then and now, I want to briefly talk about another article by Carlo, which was brought to my attention by my, my friend Doug Hutchinson. It's entitled Physics Needs Philosophy. Philosophy Needs Physics, and it appeared in the prestigious physics journal Foundations of Physics in 2018. Now, in this article, Carlo argues that physics is, uh, has always played an essential role in the development of science, physics in particular, and it is always likely to continue to do so. According to him, philosophy can produce methods for producing new ideas, novel perspectives, and critical thinking. This is because philosophers have tools and skills that physics needs, but which do not belong to the physicist's training. These include conceptual analysis, attention to ambiguity, accuracy of expression, the ability to detect gaps in standard arguments, to devise radically new perspectives, to spot conceptual weak points, and to seek out alternative conceptual explanations. Carlo structures his argument around three main arguments from Aristotle's Protrepticus. First is the general theory supports and is useful for the development of practice. In other words, the analysis of fundamentals do have an influence on science. The second is that those who deny the utility of philosophy are doing philosophy. And the third is that science needs philosophy, especially uh, says Aristotle, when perplexities are greatest, and Carlo believes that we're in the midst of one such period, crisis of science. I want to focus briefly on point two here. According to Rovelli, when uh, scientists such as Stephen Weinberg and Stephen Hawking claim that science has replaced philosophy and rendered it, rendered it obsolete, they are, in fact, doing philosophy. They're just not doing it very well. Their dismissal of philosophy is itself impregnated with philosophy, although they may not know or acknowledge this fact. It is based on an uncritical adoption of the ideas of Popper and Kuhn, which leads them to mistake a particular, historically circumscribed, limited understanding of science for something like an eternal logic of science. This in turn leads them to neglect one of science's key assets, its flexibility, that is, its ability to constantly redefine its own self-understanding goals, methods, and tools. As we've seen, philosophers, at least when they're doing their job correctly, have conceptual tools for addressing issues raised by continuous conceptual shifts. But scientists who deny philosophy's usefulness because they are sure they've already found the final methodology, thereby forfeit the conceptual flexibility needed to make progress. They are, in Rovelli's words, trapped in the ideology of their time. According to Rovelli's diagnosis, then, the widespread adoption by many contemporary physicists and theorists of an uncritical prescription version of the theories of Popper and Kuhn has had negative repercussions. Popper's criterion of falsifiability, when combined with Kuhn's notion of paradigm shifts and incommensurability, lead to what Rovelli calls the current why not ideology. The influence of Kuhn leads science, scientists to regard past knowledge as irrelevant when searching for new theories, and hence to ignore and discard previously successful theories, while the legacy of Popper encourages the belief that all unproven ideas and experiments are equally interesting simply because they haven't yet been falsified. For Rovelli, this methodological confusion is to blame for what he calls, and I quote, the relative sterility of theoretical physics over the past few decades, and has resulted, he says, in mountains of useless theoretical work in physics and many useless experimental investments. 
For his part, Ravelli believes that pace kun science is cumulative, at least to an important extent. Science works through continuity, not discontinuity, and the most radical conceptual shifts and unconventional ideas are always strictly motivated or forced, either by the overwhelming weight of new data or by the well-informed analysis of internal contradictions within existing theories. Science thus works by a kind of induction, building on a vast, ever-growing accumulation of empirical and theoretical knowledge, which provides the hints and insights that we need to move ahead. This is confirmed, says Rovelli, by the most important recent advances, recent advances, advances I'm sorry, in experimental physics. On Rovelli's reading, the discovery of gravitational waves and the Higgs boson, as well as the absence of supersymmetry symmetry found at the Large Hadron Collider, all tend to confirm older scientific theories and invalidate the wild speculation encouraged by the why not ideology. Nature's repeated snubs of current methodology in theoretical physics, Rovelli argues, should be grounds for a certain humility rather than arrogance in our scientific and philosophical attitudes. Now, the uncritical and perhaps sometimes unconscious following of what Rovelli considers to be outdated philosophical theories has made scientists lose sight of the fact that credibility has degrees and that reliability can be very high even when it falls short of absolute certainty. In fact, the scientific enterprise is based on degrees of credibility, which are constantly updated by new th data and theoretical developments. Thus, for Rovelli, science can best be defined, defined um, as a method for finding provisional conceptual schemes for making sense of the world. In his words, and I quote, science is not a project with a methodology written in stone, well-circumscribed objectives, or a fixed conceptual structure. It is our ever evolving endeavor to better understand the world. Near the end of his paper, Rovelli lists a number of what he considers the most pressing questions currently faced by science. These include, what is space? What is time? What is the present? Is the world is the deterministic? Do we need to take the observer into account to describe nature? Is physics better formulated in terms of A, reality, B, what we observe, or three, or C, a third option. What is the quantum wave function? What does emergence mean? Does a totality, uh, a theory of the totality of the universe make sense? Might physical laws evolve? Now I'm delighted to be able to see that most, if not all of these big questions are among the ones that we attend to address in our MPIWG speaker session on scientific questions then and now. Agreeing with Ravelli that when it comes to seeking solutions to these questions, failing to take previously successful theories into account is a dangerous methodological error, we want to extend the category of previously successful theories all the way back to the scientific philosophical theories of antiquity and the pre-modern period in general. It is not impossible, we believe, that at least some aspects of ancient theories of space, time, matter, and creation, if they were better known to contemporary practicing scientists, might be of interest to them, and perhaps even serve as a source of inspiration, as the works of Plato and Aristotle did for many of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, for example. But of course, the influence here is by no means unidirectional, as Carlo also underlines. Just as we believe contemporary scientists might conceivably find stimulation and inspiration from some aspects of ancient thought, so, just as importantly, it is incumbent upon contemporary philosophers and historians of pre-modern thought to have at least some basic notions of the most recent developments of science. As Ravelli points out at the conclusion of his article, and I quote, just as the best science listens keenly to philosophy, so the best philosophy will listen keenly to science. No great philosopher of the past would ever have thought for a moment of not taking seriously the knowledge of the world offered by the science of their times. So on that note, it is my pleasure and honor to hand over the uh, speaker's podium to Carlo Rovelli. Carlo, thank you very much for being with us. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, Michael, and thank you all of you. I'm uh, uh, very honored and humbled by this uh, <clears throat> in introduction. Thank also for um, Michael in particular, uh, referring so much to uh, 
that work of mine because it uh, it simplifies my job now in talking about uh, um, um, about my paper on Aristotle. You you framed it uh, uh, in 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 my view of the. Uh, what I think is the most interesting view of the relation between uh, um, um, philosophy and science, and also uh, to some extent of my view of what what, uh, what science is. So now now it's easier for me to uh, to talk about this paper uh, in particular. So let me share screen and start. Um, uh, let's see, poor short of screen. Uh, yes, okay, here I am. And stop me if uh, there is a problem, uh, any technical problem. Otherwise, I go ahead. So, um, once again, thank all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. I certainly feel myself uh, very much in tune with um, what um, the, the, the three of you have said uh, in opening the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this meeting. And, and I very much regret that I'm not, we're not in person altogether for, uh, for doing that, sort of looking at each other's uh, eyes. I'm going to <clears throat> talk a very specific. Uh, uh, um, uh, topic, uh, which is Aristotle physics, uh, and uh, um, I, uh, as you mentioned, this is a, a paper of mine uh, published in, um, in 2015 in the in the Journal of the uh, American Philosophical Association. Um, just to make the point that um, what I'm going to say is is not totally trivial. Let me say that it was not easy to publish this paper. Um, the, uh, the it, it, there were many referees unhappy with it, especially among the historians. Uh, not so much because of the content of the paper, but about the methodology of the paper. Somehow, uh, they complain that that's not the kind of thing that you should do when you talk about a ancient uh, thinker uh, like Aristotle. Uh, you should not look at an ancient thinker in terms of your own um, uh, uh, your own worldview, uh, or in terms of your uh, later language, because uh, uh, you're committing the sin um, of uh, 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 using the wrong concept for understanding um, uh, uh, the. The, 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 what actually uh, he was doing. Uh, it was a long battle. Uh, just to say, the paper was accepted with nine referee reports at the end, each one of them several pages long, <laughs> to which I responded. And I have to thank the director of the Journal of the American Physical Association that uh, believed in this paper and at the end it, it came out. At the end of the day, I think that the, uh, the main uh, central part of the paper, the technical part of the paper, in my opinion, is actually uncontroversial. Um, or if you want, the opinion of a physicist uh, is uncontroversial. Maybe the, the framing, the exercise, is, it might be controversial, but not the, not the, uh, not the main point. Um, in spite of the fact that it definitely goes against um, the physics of Aristotle, it's, it's usually presented. And I will say exactly in, in, in which way and how, in which sense, and also what I mean by the physics of Aristotle, which is not, uh, uh, not obvious. Um, let me start, actually, let me, uh, no, let me say um, what I'm gonna do in the, uh, in the talk. There's two things. First is a very specific observation about the physics of Aristotle. I'll sort of describe it and, and make a point about, uh, uh, about it. And then from there, some general um, observation about history uh, of science and philosophy of science, which will not be long, will be short. Uh, and uh, in a sense, they're largely uh, been um, anticipated uh, by, by Michael, by Alexander, by Katia. In, 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 um, uh, so I, I'll come back to those, uh, uh, very much those points. And uh, in brief, uh, um, the observation of the physical Aristotle, so this is a anticipation, is that contrary to what is commonly stated, uh, in fact, in very many texts talking about the physical Aristotle, I would claim that from a model scientific perspective, Aristotle physics is top quality science in a of course, science is a word that one can be used in all sorts of uh, connotations, uh, uh, but not quite much in the modern sense of science with some qualification, which I, I will say. So I would say it's a very good physics. It's not bad physics, extraordinarily good physics. Or if you want, there is a narrative that uh, 
sort of scientific understanding of the world was uh, blocked by the fact that dogma of Aristotelian physics uh, continued for centuries. And when finally uh, some uh, Bacon, Galileo, whatever, could get rid of the dogma and get out of it, uh, uh, modern science could be born and uh, the world can be understood. I would argue that this is nonsense. It's the other way around. The reason Aristotle physics survived for long, uh, it's not to survive for a millennium or two, it's just more complicated, but survive for all is that it's a really good physics. It's, it's much better than all alternatives available at the time. And the second, it's a general comment. Um, and it's a point about history of science, uh, which it's uh, sort of my response to the historians that when you look at the ancient uh, thinker, you can, you can have two different questions in mind. One is what was he actually doing? Let's try to understand it um, at best. And of course that you have to forget the future. But if you want to understand the development of thinking, if you want to understand how um, the, uh, what happened in a century affected what happened next, uh, then you have to look at what happened that century at the light of the next century. So you have to look at the past at the light of the future and you understand something more um, about, um, um, about uh, uh, the, the, the previous century. And this for a person trained in, in science like me, it's a common exercise. I mean, you, you, you study Newtonian physics and you study Einstein, Einstein physics, I don't know, general relativity, and then you look how Newtonian physics sits into Einstein relativity and you understand much better the, um, the relation between Newtonian physics and the world as we be, is better described by general relativity. All right, so this is where, where I wanna go. And before actually going to point one, let me start uh, opening up with a little uh, intro, super short, uh, uh, just to raise your curiosity, which is the following. Uh, I wanna ask all of you, uh, just think about the answer, uh, two questions. First, whether uh, objects um, uh, that fall, fall at constant speed or not. And second, whether um, heavier object, they have here a clock, and, and this is a piece of uh, um, some, some, some drags inside. Uh, whether if I let them go, they fall at the, um, uh, together or the heavier object falls uh, fast. Now, I don't want to collect your answers. You have different levels of knowledge of, uh, of physics, uh, but I'm sure that a large uh, fraction of people who have been at school and uh, uh, who have uh, heard the discussion about that at school uh, will say that, uh, um, well, uh, Aristotelian physics objects fall at constant uh, speed and heavier objects fall fast, but this is of course obviously wrong because as we know, and as was understood by Galileo, um, the objects fall at constant acceleration, not at constant speed, okay? So the, the, the fundamental law of how things fall it's just the acceleration is constant. And in fact, 9.8 meter um, uh, per second square, uh, that's acceleration. So it's they, they, they start slower than they accelerate. And most important, all objects fall in the same manner, right? The, 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 the heavy and um, light object fall in the same way. That's what we uh, are told at school, that oh, I was told at school, I, I believe it. And uh, in fact, it's a, uh, how did Galileo find out? Well, he just tried, observed, he let things fall from the uh, cannonballs fall from the Tower of Pisa. And uh, how surprising is that uh, Aristotle did not observe nature, did not look carefully, not only him, but for centuries, all the intellectuals who thought about that, none of them thought about looking out and observing nature. It took, for instance, Bacon, it took, uh, 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 Renaissance ideas, naturalism and Renaissance to finally base our knowledge of nature on observation rather than on pure speculation. Um, well, I wanna argue that all this is pure bullshit for a number of reasons. One being that, uh, are you sure that um, heavier object and light object fall at the same speed? Why don't you try? Just try and you will see that Aristotle is right and uh, a heavier object definitely 
uh, fall faster than light objects. Somebody may ask, well, you know, yeah, but there is air. But sure, of course, there is air. Aristotle never, never ever said if there was no air, things would fall different speed. He said there is air, and things fall fast. And uh, do they follow constant speed? Well, just try, look at them, and see whether you can see any acceleration. I'll come back to that. Good. So after this introduction, uh, let me go to the uh, to the actual. Uh, Point. So this is what is usually said about Aristotle uh, physics. I, uh, I looked around. I mean, in the, the Stanford online encyclopedia, there isn't even an entry on Aristotle physics. Um, there are plenty of entries about Aristotle everything, but not about his physics. Um, uh, the books that talks about that, the usual uh, uh, the most common, there are some small exceptions, but the most common view is that uh, Aristotle either got everything wrong, or if you want to be nice with him, he was not really doing science, he was doing something else. And that's, is, uh, for instance, the way Bolton um, expresses um, in, in the 90s, he says, traditionally, um, traditional scholars have found con notion congenial that Aristotle intended uh, method in his work on natural sciences, empirical, even as um, they criticized him for failures on that count. So he was trying to do empirical science, but he failed. But he said, Bolton, now we know better the current generation of universities verdict uh, and the physics, this is a physics book actually, in particular is now standardly taken as a paradigm of sort of use of dialectic method, understood as largely conceptual or a priori technique, come back to that, um, or inquiry appropriate for philosophy as opposed to the more empirical inquiries, which nowadays we typically regard as scientific. In other words, either uh, Aristotle was doing science and it was doing it wrong, or it was not doing science at all, so it doesn't make any sense in to try to read um, uh, what Aristotle was doing as a, 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 an account of how nature works. Again, I want to claim that this is bullshit. So my claim is uh, that Aristotle physics, first of all, um, it's counterintuitive. That, that's another uh, common way Aristotle is blamed. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's either blamed because what he says about motion is wrong, or because it's just plainly intuitive and obvious, which the two things can hardly go together. Uh, I want to say it's, it's, it's very counterintuitive. Uh, it's, uh, uh, in a sense, it's, it's more complex and counterintuitive than the alternatives. Uh, sort of sciences of his time, I don't know, Plato Timaeus or Democritus atomism uh, and so on. So it's complex, difficult, counterintuitive. Second, it definitely impossible that is based on pure thinking. It's based on observations. You don't come out with a theory like that with a very detailed campaign of observations. And more importantly, that's the point I want to stress is correct. Correct in its domain of validity, in the same sense in which we say today that Newtonian physics, which is used by all engineers to draw, to 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 build houses or to build uh, um, uh, airplanes, uh, or to you know send people to the moon, we use Newtonian physics. Uh, so it's correct in that sense. Um, in that precise sense, um, Newtonian physics is is correct. Namely, it's correct in its domain of validity. Um, uh, it's certainly wrong in the same sense in which Newtonian physics is wrong, or for that matter, Einstein physics is wrong, or for that matter, the standard model is wrong. Namely, there are uh, domains where uh, that escape that description. We know for sure for general relativity, I mean, inside a black hole, we know that the theory goes wrong. We know for almost sure about the standard model. We know the high energy, it, it gives uh, uh, silly predictions. So um, you don't really give silly prediction if you go outside its domain of validity, like uh, uh, Newton theory. And in fact, uh, Newton theory works very well for Mars, well, very well for Venus. It doesn't work well for Mercury because we're going out. Mercury goes move too fast, going out of its domain of validity. And I want to say that uh, the same is true for Aristotle. So specifically, the actual relation from a perspective of a physicist between uh, um, uh, Aristotle physics and Newton physics is the same as the relation between Newtonian physics and general relativity. Mm -hmm. Namely, mm -hmm. um, 
the, the, the previous theory uh, describes a regime of phenomena, giving the same result as the next theory uh, within an approximation of once, provided that one stay within, um, within a domain. So that's a claim, and now I'm going to the to the uh, I'm going to the to, to, to the meat of the story, more, more technical. So Aristotle physics is the correct approximation to Newtonian physics in the particular in a particular domain, at the domain where we usually uh, humanity conduct this business. So our domain in which we are we care about. So what is this domain? We are on the surface of the Earth, right? There's gravity which pull things down in some sense, uh, or whatever. Um, there is air or water. It's, the theory includes uh, uh, include that. So we're immersed in air or water. We're immersed in a fluid. That's a part of the specification of uh, uh, where the theory makes sense. Aristotle is very clear on that. We'll come back. Um, plus, the, we see things in the sky moving. And so uh, the theory accounts for those as well that, that, that move there. So the, the, the domain of validity of the theory includes both the things of the sky and uh, uh, the motion on the Earth. So what the theory, let me, um, let me uh, sketch it. And let me say that by physics of Aristotle, I don't mean the book physics. Um, I mean the body of uh, information about nature that one can find in Aristotle, uh, a little uh, part in the book physics, but more I would say on the, the heavens and the cello, um, which concerns the class of phenomena that today we describe uh, uh, in the science called physics, right? This is not, there's no complete overlap between um, uh, the total definition of what he means by physics and what we today we mean by physics because the book the physics is a spectacular book independently from that i think there are fantastic discussions of the nature of time the nature of space the nature of limit uh, which i'm i'm not going into that's not what i'm talking about um those parts of discussion do concern physics uh, today because uh, there are open questions in quantum gravity, there are open questions about the nature of space and time, general relativity, once you consider quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the comparing the kind of theory that you study at school when you take a physics class will, uh, about a class of phenomena with what Aristotle says about the class of phenomena. And the class of phenomena, it's characterized by um, um, Aristotle by a particular subclass of change, which is what we call motion and, and how things move in, 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 in modern terms. So what is theory? The theory is that if you want to understand what you move, you first have to introduce a distinction. That's a, a fantastic idea of Aristotle. Uh, a natural movement and a violent or unnatural caused uh, uh, movement. That's a basic conceptual uh, step, which, uh, as far as I know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that because I'm not an expert, appears in Aristotle. I don't, I don't, I haven't found it in, in Plato, Democritus, or earlier, uh, earlier thinking, or elsewhere in other civilizations. So Aristotle says, if you want to think about motion, first of all, distinguish two kinds of motion. How uh, things move by themselves, and how things move if they're pushed or pulled by something else. Second case is the violent uh, motion. Um, and it's characterized by the fact that uh, you act it, needs an agent, and then uh, the motion uh, ceases after the agent uh, has stopped acting, okay, after the cause has... Uh, now, there's a long discussion here on, uh, I mean, uh, which gave rise to a lot of middle-aged uh, criticism, of, um, evolutions change, the impetus theory, on whether uh, the motion stops immediately, how does it continue? Uh, that's, that's a beautiful part of the story. I'm not going into that. Um, then there's a natural uh, motion, which is how things move, by, so, so to say, by themselves, without an explicit uh, something pushing or pulling it. And uh, then, uh, if you want to understand natural motion, Aristotle says we need a little bit of cosmology, uh, because natural motion is different in the sky and on the Earth. In the, so the cosmology is that uh, the universe uh, um, sort of spherical around the Earth, right? Of course, and uh, uh, there is uh, a the, the Earth with a sphere in the center, a sort of number of uh, spherical shell around it, and the 
uh, outside the, the, the shell of fire, there is the, 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 the heavens and the, in the heavens where, which is location of all uh, star and planet we see, sun and moon within the sky, the natural motion is very simple, the circular period, circular around the center, right? On the Earth, which is where the theory is more developed, natural motion is uh, uh, complicated. And uh, it's, uh, natural motion is vertical, first of all. Uh, so it's not circular around the center, but it's vertical either towards the center of the Earth or in the opposite direction, okay? And uh, it goes toward what? Toward the natural um, place, the natural place of the thing moving. So the idea is that, uh, first of all, uh, objects uh, are made by a combination of four elementary uh, substances, right? Earth, air, fire, water. Uh, and second, in the cosmology, these substances have natural places. The Earth in the center, where Earth is both the, the name of the planet and the, the, the substance, of, main substance of which is, is made. Then there's a shell, which is water. Then there's a shell, which is air. Then there's a shell, which is fire. And then, if you have a piece of uh, uh, sort of water which happened to the air, it wants to go back to its natural place, it goes toward the uh, water. And if you have a, a, a piece of a body, which is a combination of these things, it moves up or down, depending of which part prevails, uh, so to say. All right, so things move up or down, depending on this, uh, this thing, the, 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 the structure and where they are. And how do they move? Well, they move at constant speed, right? And uh, that's a point I started from. And what is the speed? Well, the speed is larger if the object is heavier and is lighter if the object is, is less if the object is uh, lighter. Uh, but that's not all because uh, uh, two objects uh, with the same weight move at different speeds depend on the medium in which they are, the fluid in which they're immersed. Uh, remember, every object considered here is immersed in a fluid. Uh, so the more dense is the fluid, the less is the velocity. The more um, uh, less dense is the fluid, the higher is the velocity. So uh, if you take a stone, for instance, and you let it go, it moves a certain speed in air. But if you take the same stone and you move it in water, it goes more slowly. Okay. Now, if I know the weight and I know the fluid, so the density of the fluid, does this determine the velocity? No, says Aristotle. Uh, because it also depends on the shape. So every object has a shape and uh, two objects with the same weight and uh, falling in the same medium fall at different speed depending on the shape, right? Uh, in parentheses here are all the references where in most of these two books that they mentioned, he, uh, HE is the, the heavens, uh, the cello and PH is the physics, the, the, book, the book physics where uh, this is, uh, this is stated. Now, if, uh, uh, since the, the velocity, it's sort of inversely proportional, uh, it's total mathematics is really, really minimal. Okay, it's almost known. But it has some, some minimal understanding of mathematics. Uh, I mean, Plato is better. Um, and uh, he has an idea of inverse proportionality or something like that. I don't want to be too detailed here. I, I'll come back to it him and mathematics later. Um, but uh, since the velocity is sort of inversely proportional uh, with, with the density of fluid, if the density is zero, the velocity is infinite, right? It follows from the above. Now, if the density is infinite, this means that there's a problem. So uh, therefore, the theory is not compatible with, with a zero density or with void, vacuum. And that's one of the arguments, one of the various arguments, in fact, the strongest argument that Aristotle uses to say that it's impossible, um, the existence of vacuum is impossible. Uh, there's no vacuum in, uh, because it would, it would, uh, it would, uh, things would move into velocities would not make sense. Now, I've taken a liberty, this is definitely an anachronism. I mean, historians accuse me of anachronism. Uh, this is definitely a of trying to express this various dependence in modern terms. So the velocity is proportional to the weight, inversely proportional, sorry, which I call W, inversely proportional to the density of the fluid, which I call rho. Now, uh, so it doesn't have the mathematics. So this is compatible with different powers 
I could do pivot, put different, different power uh, W, different power rho. But one can say, I could say sort of it's sufficiently generic that what is saying in, in modern terms is that the velocity is proportional to the ratio W of, of, of rho to some uh, positive n, some positive power n the number real number n is positive, uh, but there is a, 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 a coefficient here which depends on the shape of the body, right? So velocity depends on three numbers, the three quant physical quantities, the weight, the density, and the shape. Now, if anybody says that this is immediate, intuitive, obvious, I mean, come on, close your eyes and uh, forget this and say, okay, give me your account of physics, how things move, would you come out with something like that? No, okay? In fact, nobody else did, okay? It's very complex and complicated. Um, it's a kind of funny relational notion, right? The things don't move. Uh, so why is four substances? Because what matters uh, is who is heavier than who, obviously, right? I mean, he's trying to account all sorts of things. Why, um, why smoke goes up, fire goes up, but rain goes down and a piece of wood goes down in air, but goes up in water. I mean, everything makes sense in this uh, in this story. This is uh, actual. Uh, this is the same as before, but it's actual uh, almost quotation from the books. Uh, I could I could go through them. I don't um, just to say I'm not inventing. This is uh, this is word by word what is written in those uh, in those books. I just put a little bit of order and use a little bit a. Um, modern uh, language in, in talking about the things. Now, let me come to the pin point. Is this right or is this wrong? Okay, well, we know that if I want to describe how things move uh, uh, on Earth and in the sky to the approximation that uh, uh, Aristotle uh, had access to, namely, forget quantum phenomena, forget relativistic phenomena, it's nothing of what he could observe uh, uh, goes into relativistic domain and quantum domain. Newtonian physics is very good. That's what we think. So Newtonian physics is supposed to be good to describe that physics. So let's see, let's take Newtonian physics. Now we are in the 20th century or the 18th century, whatever you want, or 21st century. And we use Newtonian physics and we check, that's what I'm doing, whether what, Aristotle said is right or wrong, okay? So I take Newtonian physics and Newton physics is based on a single equation, F equal MA and the F is a force and we have instructions about the forces. So here are the forces which are relevant in that particular domain. There's gravity, of course, uh, which is given by Newton, the Newton formula for gravity. So it's a force pulling down, uh, but there is a, uh, the body is immersed in a fluid. So because of the weight of the fluid, there's buoyancy. And the buoyancy is proportional to the volume of the body and uh, the density of the fluid, okay? And it falls in the other uh, direction. But that's not sufficient, that's not all. There's also friction, because when you move in a, in a, in a fluid, there's friction. So that's the friction terms, so also to the square of velocity, and it's the direction of minus the velocity is, 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 is friction. Plus there is any other force, okay? If I'm pulling something, there's also the force of my hand pulling something. Um, you take this, you replace F with MA, A is acceleration, is the second derivative of, of Z, for instance. So you get a differential equation and that tells you how things move according to Newton theory. So the first thing you, you say, you notice is that there's this term here, which is uh, um, whether or not there is uh, something else besides just the fluid, the earth and, and, and so on. And that is what uh, Aristotle call a, a violent motion, of course. So violent motion is if there is uh, this other uh, term, if I push something, then this is given by this other term here, of course. So that's fine. And of course, um, if I push something, um, it's gonna stop after a while because there's friction, okay? So if I throw something, there's friction, it's gonna stop. So uh, binary motion exhausts itself. It's a fact. Everything push, it stops. Uh, now let's go look at natural motion. Natural motion if this is zero. So then we have a differential equation, we can solve it. 
Okay, so good physicists that in uh, the article I go step by step, I do various details. I don't want to bore you with mathematics here. That's the solution. Okay, that's the velocity solution for the velocity, not for the position. The velocity is a function of time, is a solution of this equation. Um, it's a function of time, time is here, t, and all the others are uh, uh, constant that come into this equation here. Okay, m is uh, uh, the mass of the body, g is uh, sort of a big G over m over a square, is a, a Galileo constant, acceleration. Uh, v is the volume, rho is, uh, uh, is the density of the fluid. C is this uh, constant here that uh, uh, it determines, uh, it depends on the shape of the body, which determines the friction, standard physics, it, you, what you do now in textbooks. And then you have an hyperbolic tangent of time. Okay, I'll come to the boy tangent in a moment, where the, uh, uh, the, the coefficient here is, uh, is, again, depends on this constant here. Now, this is a parabolic tangent. This is what happened to the velocity. So if you, something falls, it has a first phase in that the velocity grows, and then it goes to constant velocity. Constant velocity, okay? So after an initial first phase, which, or Galilean phase, because that's what Galileo focused on, uh, it goes to a constant velocity, which we could call the Aristotelian phase, okay? What is this velocity? Well, it's given by this formula here, okay? Where mg is the, uh, is, 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 is the weight, is, uh, is w. Uh, most of the time we are in an approximation where rho is, is, is uh, it's, uh, it's small, so it can be approximated in this manner uh, here, which is, uh, says that the velocity depends uh, uh, directly proportional with some power here to the weight. So it's larger for a heavier object, it's less uh, uh, for a denser fluid, and it depends on the constant that depends on the shape, right? So the constant velocity to which things fall, it's larger for heavy body, it's uh, uh, larger in air than in water. And for two objects with the same weight and the same, uh, um, uh, in, in the same fluid, it's, uh, it depends on, uh, on the shape, right? That's exactly what uh, Aristotle um, uh, observes. Um, I, I want to stress this. This is not something you get from pure thinking. This is, <laughs> you don't get something like that unless you do careful observations of nature. Yeah, you, know, you have to take a glass of water and have different things falling down, a coin, a stone, and, and, uh, and so on, and weigh things and see that in spite of the difference, uh, weight, the shape matters, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I could go through the, all the, 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 the quotations before, and. Uh, they all are consequences from Newtonian theory, right? Motion can be distinguished in violent and natural, so we can do from Newtonian theory correctly. Uh, once the effect of the agent causing a violent motion exhausts the violent motion ceases. Oh, I didn't talk about the heavens. Um, I don't have a slide about that because it can be faster, but uh, uh, I'll just mention it in words. So things in the heaven, um, uh, rho is negligible, so these terms are practically zero. This is negligible, so you only have this term here. But now you're very far away from the Earth, so um, you can uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, solve this in the simplest possible case, uh, uh, which is uh, for something which is in orbit, and you get the circle. So the first approximation, things do move on circle. The, uh, the moon goes move on circles around the Earth. Satellite move on circle around the Earth. So that's also correct. So um, the natural motion of the Earth is circular, at least one natural motion, according to, um, to, to, to Newtonian physics. Um, the natural motion of Earth, um, uh, water, air, and fire is vertical. That's correct, because if you let something by itself, there's no violent terms, it moves just up and down, and it goes up and down depending on whether it's heavier or lighter with respect to the medium in which it's immersed. Heavier objects fall faster, that's correct. We see that's a prediction of Newtonian physics. Uh, the same object fall faster in the less dense medium, that's correct, prediction of Newtonian physics. The shape of the body accounts in addition to its um, weight and the density. And what about vacuum? Well, 
if you take a Newton theory and you go to this simplification, it does predict that uh, a body would move at infinite velocity um, in vacuum. The point is that you go out from the domain of validity of the approximation. So you get an infinity, which by the way, is exactly what happened in general relativity. When you, you get an infinity, when you go out of the validity of the approximation at the center of black hole, so you get an infinity. Or what happened in quantum field theory, you look for arbitrary small things, you get an infinity because you're going outside the domain of validity. That's where you know, quantum stuff, quantum gravity comes in. So um, you get an infinity because which signals that the theory is not valid anywhere anymore in, 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 in the domain in which you're, uh, you, 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 you're applied. So, this doesn't show that the vacuum cannot exist. It shows that the vacuum cannot exist within this description of natural to this validity. Now, what about this acceleration phase here? Because after all, that's definitely wrong, right? I mean, it's, if, if the statement is that things move at a constant speed, what they don't, they, they accelerate to start with. Well, here's a point. If you put numbers it, and that's, I think, the point which is constantly missed by everybody talking about this stuff. If you put number of these things, for the actual phenomena that we see around us, um, things falling, things falling in water. I mean, take a coin and put it in water and let it go down. Or take a bird which has a little stone in his uh, beak, and then it goes down and it falls into air. The duration of this acceleration phase is extremely short. It's not visible. So most of the things that we see falling, they fall, they see there. If you take a feather, let it go, it falls down at constant speed, right? If you take a very heavy object and you let it fall, it falls too fast. You cannot resolve anything about this film. So this initial phase is like mercury violation of Newton theory. It's invisible unless you start looking very, very, very carefully. So Newton theory goes wrong, like, uh, sorry, uh, Aristotle theory goes wrong in describing nature, like Newton theory does, but it needs, you know, you need to look Mercury with a very great accuracy. And you need to look uh, at nature with a very great accuracy to see that actually things don't really go at constant speed. At the beginning, they accelerate before getting to constant speed. And this was observed in antiquity, in fact, uh, uh, Philoponus make a point of that, there's, a, there's some observation. For instance, an observation is that if you have a, um, a line of water falling down uh, from, from your faucet, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's continuous and then it breaks in drops. So in late antiquity, so we are oh, sixth century, um, somebody observed that it breaks in drop. This is because it's accelerating, right? Like the car in the highway when they accelerate, they just separate from one another. So the drops separate from one another because the one down goes faster uh, away. So somebody observed that, right? This, uh, the, that the water breaks in drop by falling and said, wait, if so, then there's a problem in Aristotle because he says the things fall at the same speed. Why don't stay together? But you see, you need very, very subtle and detailed phenomena to find out that there is a mistake. It's not that, uh, oh, how people were so stupid not to look at and try. You look at try, you don't see, you just see Aristotelian physics, okay? You have to detect this initial, how did Galileo do it? Galileo would definitely realize that there's a problem here. He's the one who realizes there's a problem here. How did he do it? By an intuition, which is, uh, a snap of genius, if you want, which was completely ungranted at his time, it was later proved to be right, okay? But he just guessed that if you make things roll along an incline, the way they fall is the same that if you uh, let things fall uh, freely. So he said, well, it should be the same, okay? And why? Well, because I'm a Galileo and I have good intuition, okay? And it took a century to prove that the intuition was correct. Um, and, and now, now they they're falling, okay, are rolling down, and now they're slowly slowing down. So I can measure them, okay. And he measured them. We don't know exactly how he measured them. The beautiful historian uh, works on how exactly he did that. Uh, so that's 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 a guess. The little little I don't know if you see them in the picture. They're little bells uh, at different distances from one another. And he was a musician, so he put the. Uh, the different bell at, at a certain speed so that the, the ding, 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 ding was easily spaced. And he's a very good musician 
uh, training allowed him to um, to uh, to place the bail so that the equal times were um, were respected. And then he measured the space, and then he sees that the space up is smaller than the space down, so it's accelerating. Okay, that's one hypothesis of how he did that. Um, be because with this water clock, it would have been too difficult. So he has a very ingenious way of uh, of uh, sort of looking at this initial phase of motion, and he find out that indeed uh, there's a problem in, in in Aristotle because Aristotle says it's just this major observable uh, uh, phenomenon uh, uh, here. So. Um, you see, there is a, I, I, I'm basically done. I just want to come to some uh, general comments about that. There is a, but let me put it strongly. This is a book, uh, 2014, on Aristotle, um, which concludes by saying, um, we can say that nothing of Aristotle's vision of the cosmos has remained valid. Okay, I, I would, uh, conclude the opposite. Virtually everything of Aristotle's theory of motion is still valid today. It's perfectly valid. Um, again, it's valid in the same sense in which Newton's theory is valid, okay? It's within its uh, approximation. Now, of course, um, there are a lot of things which are wrong in Aristotle theory, right? Uh, and which are incomplete from the scientific point of view of what we today call science. But for that matter, there are a lot of things which are wrong in Newton theory as well. But let me mention some of this, just to say that uh, uh, that is not that I'm overplaying the correctness of uh, Aristotelian theory. First of all, definitely he misses the initial phase. Okay, things do accelerate at the beginning before going to close velocity. So definitely he missed that, and that it was noticed later and it was observed later. Second, and that's a subtle. Uh, and that was corrected by Archimedes. Uh, that's exactly what Archimedes realized. That according to Aristotle, the, uh, uh, the, what matters is the weight, okay? Now, it's not true that what matters is the weight. What matters is uh, uh, the uh, sort of the density times the, the volume of the displaced fluid. It's not the same thing. And that's what Aristotle understood. And this is a subtlety, okay? If the body is homogeneous, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, the subtlety comes in only if the body has a funny shape. But it's technologically crucial because uh, um, if you take Aristotle theory seriously, why does a boat float? Well, because it's made of wood and wood is sort of intermediate uh, between water and air. In the composition is a composition of various things, but it's a result is intermission of water air, so it goes down in air and up in uh, water, which means that you cannot make a, um, a, a boat in metal because metal goes down, right? And in particular, you want to put as little metal as you want, as, as you can on the ship because the metal would take the ship down. So you don't want metal on the ship, you want light stuff on the ship. Okay, our committees understand that no, 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 that's completely wrong, <laughs> because you can't have a ship built with a material which is heavier than water, provided that the volume of water that it displaces is large. So that's a contradiction to um, Aristotelian physics, right? And therefore, uh, you can have uh, boats in uh, in. Uh, in metal. And as uh, Lucio Russo has pointed out, uh, this theoretical understanding had a technological application that has been huge because Aristotle is the third, uh, um, uh, uh, Archimedes is the third century. And immediately after his discovery, uh, the technology of shipbuilding changed completely because you could now cover the exterior of the ships with metal. Um, and the result is that uh, you know fish and stuff don't attach to metal; they attach to wood. So you don't have to take them out every year to clean them. And now you can because you know that the, the metal is okay, provided there is enough uh, open space inside, because of a contradiction to Aristotelian physics, right? And the uh, ships uh, uh, in the third century became suddenly 
three to five times larger than the previous one because you don't have to take them out. Uh, enormously multiplying the amount of trade in the Mediterranean and having enormous impact on the economy of the time that then was become the economy of the Roman Empire. So you see a, 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 a theoretical result about falling, about motion having huge impact on uh, technological impact and economical impact already in the third century. But this also shows that this idea that uh, um, Aristotelian was a dogma, it's completely false. I mean, if you look, if you read Ptolemy, he considers uh, you know, various alternatives and he noticed that, for instance, the historical theory would require to change the Aristotelian physics, but he doesn't present it as something not doable. He says, sure, I mean, we could change Aristotelian physics. I mean, uh, Ptolemy itself um, has the equant, which is in flagrant contradiction to Aristotelian physics. Aristotelian physics was never a dogma. Uh, it was only called a dogma by Galileo when he wanted to question it, okay? Um, sorry, I'm going around. Let me go. Um, so this is a, this is basically the same point, the distinction between weight and specific weight. Uh, to be fair, I've read and read several times these passages in, in uh, Aristotle does a little bit of confusion between weight and specific weight. So I don't want to go into, uh, into that. Um, then of course, there is a famous story about uh, that, that gave rise to the impetus theory. I mean, Aristotle has a complicated, so you launch something and then when you stop launching, why does the thing keep moving for a while instead of stopping immediately? And here's a little credible story that was uh, um, criticized since the beginning by all sorts of people, uh, which is that the air pushing the thing from the back. I don't want to go into, into that. That's not, not, that's a bad part, the weak part of this theory. Um, he definitely lacks the resources to characterize acceleration. Even if he had observed acceleration, I think he doesn't have the terms and he doesn't have the mathematics. Of course, uh, the lack of mathematics is the main difference between uh, um, uh, the kind of science that Aristotle does and the kind of science that uh, Galileo is gonna do later and that Newton uh, does. So um, that's obviously a immense improvement when uh, uh, somehow, uh, Galileo went back to Plato, right? And, and, and so to, went back to the, to the astronomers. Uh, let's use mathematics. Let's put everything in mathematical terms and, and, and everything works. This, of course, is not a, a modern thing because uh, in Alexandria, astronomy was all mathematical physics, very high level mathematical physics. Uh, but uh, but it, uh, Aristotle doesn't, uh, or whoever in his school doesn't have this, uh, uh, these tools. And then there's a subtle point about observation, which is, which is also crucial. I just want to mention this. There's a large literature on that. Aristotle is a genius of observation. Any argument that Aristotle doesn't do observation is total bullshit. The observations the basis for Aristotle biology are amazing. Um, this physics could not be done without a very careful observation of how things fall, go up and down, and speed and, and so on and so forth. So, but it was observation. What was missing or was existing, but very rare in antiquity, is the beautiful Galilean idea, essentially, which is you don't just observe, you put up a story, you interrogate nature by making up a particular, doing experiments. Experiment is different than observation. It's, a, it's observation in a uh, control setting which you yourself put up for, for, for. That's that's very rare I mean, in, 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 in ancient thinking, and, and I don't, I, I don't find it in this, in this. Certainly he did something like that, right? I mean, he, he certainly had things falling in water, things falling at Loki, but there is nothing like the detailed combination, especially of uh, empirical, uh, not just observation, but uh, experimental science and mathematics, which is what you know, uh, Galileo, the great gift of Galileo to, to humankind. All right, so this is all I wanted to say about Aristotle. Now, um, very uh, short uh, uh, comment at the end, uh, <clears throat> and I will be very short because uh, uh, Michael Alexander, <laughs> uh, I mean, at the beginning, and in Katia, they you 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 said already what I think about um, um, uh, about science. The um, uh, Kuhnian discontinuity. It's uh, it was crucial. Kuhn book was crucial to somehow come out of the 
of the pre-Kunian idea of science as a, as a static body or something that just grows. Uh, uh, so of course, I mean, I would never criticize Kuhn itself, but it has led to an idea of discontinuity, <clears throat> which misses completely the, um, the, 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 the continuity of science. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip this. So Einstein theory doesn't falsify Newton theory. It just uh, uh, enlarges Newton theory. It's, it's, it's valid in a larger domain. Of course, it uses a different conceptual structure, but that's the point. It used mostly the same conceptual structure with some key differences. And the way science grows, and um, that's the way I think about science. What's, what is science? It's the elabor continuous elaboration of the conceptual structure that we have and use, okay? Uh, which is always that conceptual structure, but we change pieces of it because we realize that there are ideas which, uh, uh, the, 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 the pieces that can be changed. And the, the, the metaphor is this famous metaphor uh, that Quine uses, uh, taken from Neurath, uh, like we are uh, like sailors on the open sea, um, must reconstruct the ship, but are never able to start afresh from uh, bottom. So where a beam is taken away, a new one must uh, at once be put there. And for this, the rest of the ship uses a support. By this way, by using the old beams and driftwood, the ship can be shaped entirely anew, but only by gradual reconstruction. And this is the point. We recognize in contemporary science uh, the, 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 the beams of Aristotelian uh, um, concept of structure and focus on that, the distinction between natural motion and violent motion, okay? Which is a cornerstone of, uh, um, Newton, uh, of, uh, of uh, Aristotle theory. It's also the cornerstone of Newton theory. Like Newton says, uh, things have a natural motion, okay? Just move straight at the velocity, unless there's something acting on them and he calls force. So the cornerstone, of the concept of structure of Newton theory is exactly the same. And once you go to Einstein general relativity, it's again the same. Uh, a, a, an object moving in a gravitational field has a natural motion, which is a geodesic, unless there is something up, happening in it. And notice the how uh, sort of nature tricked us here and the incredible irony of that. Gravity, it's violent motion in Newton, but this natural motion in uh, um, Aristotle, and it's also again natural motion in um, Einstein. In Einstein theory, falling is natural motion. It's not violent motion. It's natural motion in Newton because it's a force. In uh, in uh, in Einstein theory, there's no force. It's the natural motion of um, of uh, uh, um, of that thing. So um, this is a comment about uh, the uh, continuity. I think that previous theories are not incommensurable with better theories, they are that they nourish the, the, the later theory and they can be found back in the uh, in the uh, in the later theory. And I um, that's my penultimate slide. Uh, one reason for which Aristotle has so bad a, um, a press, <laughs> um, you know, Aristotle was a dogmite or wrong, we have to get out of this, we have to observe nature, that's Galileo rhetoric. Galileo so he started science by insulting Aristotle over and over and over again. But if you read it, and in fact, if, if you read the, 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 the dialogue of the maxim, two maximum systems, which I just read recently, uh, it's much more subtle than that. What he says is in, it's not insulting Aristotle, he's insulting the Aristotelians, saying, let's go back to Aristotle methodology, to Aristotle himself. And uh, it's remarkable because the continuity is not just in the content, but it's also in the methodology. There is, of course, an evolution in methodology, right? There's mathematics, there's experiment, it's not that there's no evolution. But Galileo, who is inventor of the new methodology, grounds his uh, observation of nature into Aristotle. And it's very explicit. This is two late letters. This is 1640, so it's late in his life. I mean, Punjda, as an impunger of peripatetic doctrine, where has I claim and surely believe, this is Galileo, that I observe more religiously the peripatetics, or should I rather say the Aristotelian, so the actual him, teachings, 
than do many that put me down as averse to them. And even stronger in uh, um, the same year, late in September, I'm sure that if Aristotle were returned to Earth, he would accept me among his followers on account of my few but conclusive contradiction to him. So in other words, uh, he sees clearly he building very much on Aristotle methodologically also. I mean, he's sure that uh, methods he's using, it's what Aristotle uh, um, uh, had in mind. I think he has much more clarity about the relation between um, ancient science and his science that uh, most people seeing um, after that. So um, that's my last slide. Um, I find it curious to read everywhere, why didn't Aristotle and people for, uh, for century didn't do the actual experiment and see the things fall at the same speed. And since I read it everywhere and every teacher in school, uh, uh, make this point, uh, I retort, why don't you just try and have two things falling down? And you will see that Aristotle was right. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Carlo, for, for uh, a very, very uh, entertaining and informative presentation. Now, um, we are running a little bit behind here, so instead of having a pause... Oh, sorry. Uh, no problem, no problem. Uh, the, uh, it's not your fault. The, uh, we proposed, and we had a little bit of a break scheduled here, but we proposed to just launch pretty well directly into the discussions, if everyone is okay with that. So we, we can more or less make sure to allow time for this, uh, more discussion at the end. So, Katja, would you like to? Sure. There was a reason why we called the first break interlude and not break, um, because <laughs> knowing the historians, we conjectured that um, all of us are alike um, by going over time. Um, so we're all in the same boat also there. Um, now, please uh, thank you, Carlos, so much for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm sure I have as many questions as everyone else. But let's move on uh, to our three historians of philosophy. I'll briefly introduce them to you. And then each of you has about roughly 15 minutes to give a response. OK, so it is my great pleasure after the stimulating lecture uh, Carlo Rovelli is to chair the second part of today's event, the responses to his lecture. I expect that they will be as engaging and thought provoking as Carlo's lecture itself. There are many reasons why I think this will be the case, but let me point out just two. All three respondents have worked on the history of philosophy and science um, in a way that matches Carlo's approach. In many of their works, they have answered the question, what is science, with a focus on science as a distinctive product, a theory. I can't wait to see if they will take this approach in their areas of expertise today as well. Speaking of areas of expertise, this brings me to the second reason. All three of our respondents are noted experts in pre-modern natural philosophy, and they all have widely published in this area. Gottfried Heinemann is a professor of philosophy at the University of Kassel and the world leading expert on Aristotle. He has just published a new translation on Aristotle's physics with minor publishers, the publisher in the German speaking world for translations of ancient and medieval philosophical texts. Riccardo Chiaradonna is professor for ancient philosophy at Università Roma III and a world leading specialist on Plotinus and the Aristotelian tradition. He co-edited two exciting volumes that are relevant for our theme tonight. The first is on physics and philosophy of nature and Greek Neoplatonism, uh, co-edited with Franco Trabatoni in 2009. And then he edited the second volume on his own, a volume on Platonism and science in 2012. The third in the round is Peter Adamson, professor of late ancient and Arabic philosophy at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich. And Peter has a few months ago, just been named the world's, uh, among the world's top 50 thinkers of 2021. So I don't need to say more, but Peter is probably best known for his podcast, The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. But 
I should say his most relevant publications for tonight are probably a series of articles on physics in the post Avicennian tradition, including Fakhadin Arazi's physics and Yahya ibn Adi's physics. There's much, much more to say about each of you. And thank you so much for being here tonight. But I must stop for reasons of time. So please join me um, in welcoming all three respondents to Carlo's exciting talk. And let's dive into matters of physics, pun is intended, uh, with Gottfried Heinemann's response. Okay, then. So I will, start, I will just start with my paper. Great, thank you. Um, Carlo Rovelli has embedded Aristotle's claims about the speed of falling bodies into Newtonian physics. I will add in my paper, in my comments, uh, some observations concerning the way in which Rovelli's argument sheds light on the context of those claims in Aristotle. Um, uh, Professor, Ravel, uh, Professor Heinemann, we now see your PowerPoint. Ah, fine, fine. I don't see them, but that's no, uh, that's another question. I have uh, three, uh, three um, catchwords. One is void, another is timetables, and the last catchword is um, the law of uh, predominance. And I think maybe I will have to skip the last one, but, uh, but I will begin with a void. Aristotle famously denies that there is any void. Uh -huh. Ah, that's it. Fine. Aristotle famously denies that there's any void. In a way, this conflict with modern science, whereas Aristotle bodies fall in fluids, water or air, Galileo's bodies fall in the void. So in a way, Aristotle's, Aristotle, Aristotle's claim that there is no void would deprive Galileo's science, more precisely his demoti, demoto naturaliter accelerator in the discourse of his subjects matter. Does it? Of course not. Motion in the void is just an idealization. And in the case of some key phenomena, a good approximation. But Galileo's key phenomena are not Aristotle's. And this is one of the reasons why Aristotle has no use for Galileo's idealization. A fundamental issue in Galileo is the refutation of, of Ptolemy's arguments from physics against the doctrine that the air moves and that the earth moves. In short, Galileo seeks a physics for Copernicanism. Aristotle seeks a non-atomist refutation of the Eleatic arguments against plurality and motion. Void is just one topic in this program. Melissos, the pupil, probably pupil of, or follower of Parmenides, argues that since there is no void, there can be no motion, for in a plenum, nothing can recede to a place not yet occupied. There's no place, there's, there's nothing there to go. Atomism concludes that since there's motion, there must be void. Aristotle denies the common premise of both, that nothing recedes in the plenum is true of rigid bodies, but not of fluids. Take a block of marble or concrete on the one hand and a bowl of soup on the other. Nothing moves inside the block unless the block is split up. And if marble is body, the space thereby created is void. By contrast, portions of soup move freely within the bowl and so do the lumps in it since it is possible for things simultaneously to make way for one another, which was a quote from Aristotle from the physics. Note, 
that this is a matter of model rather than concepts. The Aristotelian cosmos is a bowl surrounded by the celestial spheres and filled with fluids, lumps, and a petrified sediment in the center. In so far, ah yeah, geometry secures that Belisso's argument does not reply to the celestial spheres. They are movable because they are just spheres. Um, the sediment, the earth rests in the center, which is its proper place, but external forces may displace parts of it. Later in the physics, when Zeno's arguments are at issue, Aristotle will turn to conceptual analysis. But Aristotle's conceptual scheme is also adapted to the model described. Two remarks are in order. First, the definition of place, inner boundary of surrounding body, makes only sense in the plenum. So there isn't place in the void. Second, and that's even more important, motion, wait, I think, ah, yeah, here is already there, thank you. Motion is never without friction and hence needs a permanent mover. Accordingly, Aristotle's definition of modes of process, fulfillment, and the of the thing which is potentially at D, qua being potentially at D, where D is the destination, is transformed into, and I over, already take number three, motion is the joint manifestation of the thing which has the capacity to move something towards the destination, for having that capacity, and of the thing which has the capacity to be moved towards that destination, qua having this destination. The case of falling bodies, the mover indicated at the end of uh, physics 8.4 is just a stimulus which triggered the manifestation, cutting the rope on which a stone is hung up, etc. Aristotle's is said the power. Aristotle attributes to place must do the job. The drive and direction of natural movement is thus delegated to the surrounding bodies correspondingly with Aristotle's account in physics three. Yes. Aristotle's a short <laughs> remark, a short remark concerning and Aristotle's argument from speed. I'm not absolutely happy with Carlo Rovelli's account of this argument because there's one point. Aristotle is right in neglecting the initial phase for the cases which, he actually, which actually occur. But in the, in the void, of course, in the initial phase never ends. There is no final phase. And so the warrant of the neglect, Aristotle's warrant of the neglect, which he has in his real cases, does not transfer to the thought experiment about, to, to his thought about experiment about the void. So I think there is a fallacy in Aristotle's argument, but a fallacy he in a sense could not see. Okay, and just, and already I am with the parameters and need the next PowerPoint. Yes, parameters. There is what, what I call the timetable approach to motion. A timetable, for instance, you have a, just an example, timetables for trains, display lists of places, each with a specification of a time, Halle at that time, Erfurt, Nuremberg, etc. If you show the destination in the list, the timetable tells you what time the train is scheduled to arrive there. But the timetable is not designed to indicate the place passed by the train at a given time. 
The journey is described by a mathematical function with place as in the pendant and time as dependent variables. Similarly with speeds, of course. That's important. The timetable approach tells you how much time it takes to get from here to there. The less time extends, the faster is the train. But the timetable is not designed to tell you the distance done in a given amount of time, which would mean that the timetable approach does not show you anything from which you would transfer the Galileo's definition of motion or the modern definition of motion. It is, would be quite diff difficult to uh, define it in terms of that approach. Conversely, the standard, uh, the standard account of motion in physics has time as independent and the distance done as dependent variables. Can I have the next PowerPoint? Um, the classical statement is Russell's. Motion consists merely in the fact that bodies are sometimes in one place and sometimes in another, and that there are intermediate places at intermediate times. Classical physics adds some technologies. Places are points and paths in are rectifiable curves in Euclidean space. Time exhi exhibit a mathematical structure which corresponds to a line or equivalently to the real number series. Hence, motion is modeled by functions of a real variable. The distance done at t is the value of the function assumed for that t. Speed is indicated by the derivative and acceleration by the second derivative. In this way, can I have the next PowerPoint? What we have already seen, of course. In this way, the conceptual scheme of modern physics brings about the greatest affinity of time with motion which informed Galileo's discussion in the Discorsi. The affinity is particularly su suggested by Galileo's law uh, of uh, law of odd numbers. Of, uh, uh, no, uh, no, okay, also this. Uh, we have the law of odd numbers. Here first, first we have these proportionalities. And of course, when he says affinity of motion with time, he says, V is proportional corresponds to T is the correct formula and not S, the distance corresponds. Uh, um, oh no, uh, not V, the velocity corresponds to the distance, which would give rise to um, exponential acceleration. So we have this, uh, uh, this proportion or the law of falling bodies. Um, <laughs> yes, we have the law of we have the law of falling bodies. Oh no, this is too early. I need a, I need I need another time this, and then you see what he does. He can he on the inclined plane he marks the places where the falling body is at given times. After one unit of time, second unit of time, third and fourth. And then he has, of course, the question how to measure time. And there is a fine article by Tillman Drake uh, who makes clear that this works with singing a song. This is, uh, I, I, took it, I took the song from Audrey's time, Deus Crea Tor Omnium, each second. And so it comes even more interesting. Uh, uh, Drake has reasons to believe that they fixed, they determined those points just by comparing the rolling ball on the inclined plane with the rhythm of the song they were singing. That's even the claim for, uh, by, uh, uh, from um, Simon Drake, but the point is here, you are given the time and then determine 
the points, the places, as in independence of the time. According, this, all of this is impossible with Aristotle. According to Aristotle, time is something of change. The doctrine clearly favors a timetable account of the correlation of places with times. Aristotle's definition of change presupposes a minimum of temporal structure indicated by tenses and the law of non-contradiction, but it is only by a court by Aristotle's account of time as something of change that an isomorphism is exhibited, which relates places with times and thereby transfers to the latter the mathematical characteristics of the former. In particular, the order and continuity of time are thereby derived from the structure of linear mag magnitudes in geometry for the transfer of a metric, the uniformity of motion would be required with which concepts is anticipated in physics four, but only physics eight and its zero two offer criteria of uniformity, which do not presuppose time measurement, which is far from trivial. The standard account of motion, speed and acceleration, takes the order and metric of time for granted. It is therefore unavailable for Aristotle, and so is the mathematical analysis of initial phases, which presupposes and, as Galileo argued, requires the standard account. In retrospect, this is clearly a case in which the requirements of conceptual rigor are impediments to the more technical advance in the mathematical modeling of physical phenomena. But conceptual rigor, conceptual rigor serves a purpose in Aristotle's physics. Aristotle's purpose is again the refutation of the of Eleatic arguments against motion, particularly of Zeno's paradoxes. The conceptual scheme outlined in the physics is designed and still struggles to eliminate, to eliminate, eliminate those paradoxes, which however is quite another story. I guess I should not go into too much details with, with my last point predominance, but if you give me if, uh, the next, yes. Perhaps, um, Professor Heinemann, we can have two more minutes and then two more minutes. Okay. we pass oh. on to Ricardo okay, Ferradonna. Wonderful. Yes. Look at Galileo's law. You have a law, you have a difference. The difference is again law-like, friction, etc. is again law-like. The law, falling bodies, is directed downwards. Friction, in this case, is upwards. So you have a conflict. In Aristotelian terms, you have a conflict of powers. And in the case of conflict of powers, modern physics has a, something like the parallelogram of forces. Aristotle has nothing similar and cannot have anything like this. What he has is the principle of predominance. In short, the stronger obtains and the winner gets it all. That is to say, either this power obtains or the other power obtains, but there is no common result of the joint action. There is no joint action of opposing powers. I think one of the reasons is that each power has an internal te uh, teleology, and one of the and one of those teleologies must annihilate the other. So one power must annihilate the other, which would say that uh, Professor Ravelli's uh, um, formulas. I'm sorry about this. Are unavailable to Aristotle uh, because he cannot add. Here, this is of course what I have here is a very abstract scheme of what uh, Ravelli has has shown to us in much more detail. 
but this edition is unavailable to Aristotle. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will pass on straight away to Ricardo Chiardone. Thank you very much. I will now try to share my screen. So can you see my PowerPoint? Perfect, yes. Great. So, so first, I am very grateful to the organizers uh, for inviting me and to Color Valley for his wonderful talk. Uh, well, I will raise a couple of general points and then uh, a, I will say something about movement. I think that uh, Rovelli's article uh, raises a challenge for all of us who work on history of philosophy. We sometimes are inclined to regard history of philosophy as, so to speak, the biography of philosophy. And that's not the case. I think that his article shows that there are uh, be conceptual issues in the history of philosophy, and we should be aware of them in a, a dialogue with uh, scientists. And that's a, that's a crucial approach, I think, for those who work on the history of, of ideas. And I will um, focus now on a couple of conclusions in his article. Um, as Rovalli says, uh, Aristotle's physics uh, is a correct and non-intuitive approximation of Newtonian physics in the suitable domain, motion in fluids. Uh, of course, every word in this sentence is very important. I will first focus on non-intuitive. Um, I think that Rovalli is certainly completely right in rescuing Aristotle from the reproach of introducing our simple, ordinary, and commonsensical statements about the word into his physics. And I very much sympathize with his criticism of those who read uh, Aristotle's physics as some kind of dialectical exercise. It's certainly not that thing. Um, his uh, analysis are uh, very persuasive. For example, what he says about Aristotle's thesis about the spherical shape of the Earth. Uh, so I, I agree with him that Aristotle's thesis is not uh, intuitive, it's not commonsensical. Maybe we, we could make some further remarks uh, on these. For example, what's the relation Aristotle regards places between shared opinion and scientific assertions? Um, scientific assertions certainly do not ratify our common opinions. That's certainly true according to Aristotle. Um, I would perhaps be less sure that Aristotle's physics can be the, described as counterintuitive. I would rather suggest that Aristotle is inclined to think that um, commonly shared views uh, are a good starting point for scientific research. And after all, there is something not completely false in them. And uh, science should explain what's true in common opinions. I, but I don't think that this is inconsistent with uh, Carlos' uh, uh, conclusion. Um, another point uh, is about approximation. Here I will be very quick because this issue has been tackled in, in detail. Of course, when you talk about uh, approximation, um, we, can, we can make some kind of proportion. So Aristotle stands to Newton uh, as Newton stands to Einstein. Is that true? I don't think that Carlberg suggests this fact. Uh, I think that there are crucial differences between Aristotle and modern physics, um, of course, as regards, for example, mathematics in physics, and also as regard the predictivity of physics. Of course, we can say that Aristotle's physics has some predictive characters, but these are more often than not general characters. So uh, it's very difficult to regard uh, Aristotle's physics as uh, being predictive in the same sense in which modern uh, uh, physics is, is predictive. Um, but I, for example, there is a very nice work by Aristotle, his work on sublunary uh, phenomena, the meteorologica. 
It's, um, it's most distant, interesting uh, work, full of observation. What is striking in this work, uh, here is a quotation of a recent monograph on, on, this, on this book, is that the predictivity is not there. Aristotle is interested in general patterns, in uh, general frameworks, which explain phenomena and so on. And by the way, I think that's, that could be a source of inspiration even for scientists. Maybe some contemporary scientists focus more on measurements than on general framework explaining what they do. I think that Aristotle can be an, a source of inspiration uh, from this point of view, precisely because is a, a account of predictivity, is account of physics is in a sense deeply different from the modern one. Um, but I will say that I, I completely agree and I think it's a, it's a quite a correct statement that Aristotle uh, um, uh, relies on careful observation, on very careful observation. And for example, although uh, Aristotle's physics does not entail uh, mathematizations of physics, uh, according to Aristotle, mathematics and physics are two completely different sciences with different principles. Uh, still, uh, I... I'm not quite sure that, uh, um, certainly as, as Carlos says, uh, uh, Aristotle did not absorb the Pythagorean belief in the power of mathematics. My question is, would he have been a better physicist if he did? Uh, I'm not quite sure about this. Um, and it's difficult to uh, uh, arrive at, 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 a, at a clear cut uh, response. It is true that the Pythagorean intuition that numbers are the principles of things and that the mathematics allows us to understand the structure of reality uh, seems close to modern physics, uh, whereas Aristotle's quality of physics is not. That's certainly true. Uh, still, as Carlo Rovalli says, the description of the word provided by Aristotle's physics um, is the result of careful and sophisticated observation uh, and in-depth research into the natural world. Um, well, what we, what we know about the Pythagorean, um, Pythagorean science of numbers points to a different direction. The, what the Pythagoreans uh, developed was some kind of a metaphysics of, of numbers, as that's a famous passage from Metaphysics Book 1, Chapter 5, numbers of the principles of all things. Um, and um, so I'm not quite sure that this view, of course, if we have, if we have Galileo in mind, then we can find uh, uh, this view as close to modern physics. But the crucial issue in Galileo's science is that we do not need to uh, inquire about the essence of things. What is, it, what is interesting are the affections and I think that the idea that the essence is numerical or not is not very important. The Pythagorean um, regarded the, the deep essence of things as numerical. Well, is this an, anticip an anticipation of Galilei? Yes and not, I would say. And what is important is that uh, unlike the Pythagorean, uh, Aristotle's account of nature is based on careful observation of phenomena. And that's what's made it close to modern uh, uh, physics. Here we have a passage from uh, an article by Jonathan Bass. Uh, of course, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very radical statement, uh, uh, but in a sense, I think it's not, it's not wrong at all. Uh, um, Aristotle's idea that painstaking research must precede uh, theoretical construction is his real contribution to natural science. Whereas, uh, well, uh, according to Bas, um, the Pythagorean Platonist metaphysics of number is the merest mumbo jumbo. That, that's, that's a bit too much, I think. But I think that um, we should be aware of this. Uh, when we mm, uh, make the contrast between Aristotle and the Pythagoreans, we should be aware that, in a sense, uh, Pythagorean mathematics is different from Galile Galileo's mathematics. Um, 
The same holds with the, uh, with the um, issue of Aristotle's biology and uh, evolutionary theories. Of course, uh, Aristotle is certainly against evolution, but still he had very good reasons to be against evolution. And uh, I wouldn't say that those cosmological speculations, uh, for example, Empedocles cosmology, uh, which are in a sense closer to evolution are better than Aristotle's biology. I wouldn't say that uh, Empedocles cosmology approximates to um, evolutionary uh, theories. Um, so uh, these are not, uh, uh, these are mere, slight qualifications to what uh, Carlo Rovelli says, uh, I uh, fully sympathize with his approach. My um, um, small disagreement is maybe about uh, his account of natural motion. Um, if I got it right, according to, to Carlo Rovelli, uh, it is uh, possible to compare the natural rectilinear motion of bodies uh, in, in, in simple bodies in Aristotle with the rectilinear and uniform motion in, in Aristotle's, in Newton's first law. So a body moves rectilinearly and uniformly if no force acts on it. Well, uh, if we accept this formulation, the analogy is certainly uh, striking. Uh, I'm not quite sure that this formulation is completely uh, faithful to what Aristotle says. Um, well, um, can we say that, for example, according to Aristotle, an object left to itself moves with rectilinear and uniform motion? I would be cautious on this. What is an object left to itself, according to Aristotle? I would rather say that according to Aristotle, the subject, the substratum of motion, that is the object, moves in virtue of some motive component, and that the motion caused by this motive component in the moving object is always a motion with an initial and final point, that is the natural place. Of course, Aristotle say that mm, motion in, in void would never stop, but this is precisely meant to demonstrate that motion in void is impossible is not some kind of an, of an anticipation of a Newton first law. When Aristotle say motion in void would never stop, the inference he draws that motion in void is actually not, uh, not possible. Um, a, a key principle in Aristotle's physics is that uh, omne quad movetur ab alio movetur, that is everything that moves, moves insofar as it is moved by something else. This is the key principle in physics book eight, and it is the principle that leads to postulate the existence of a first and a moved mover. I think what is very difficult in, in Aristotle's account of uh, elementary motion is that apparently he regards elementary motion as a particular case of these general principles. He doesn't say that elementary motion is something else. But still, in order to apply this principle to elementary motion, we have to make very substantial qualifications. And I think uh, that's, that's a, 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 of course, a very, a very difficult issue in Aristotle physics. And that's why, for example, all the commentators for antiquity onwards were so puzzled by, uh, by elementary motion. Um, so according to Aristotle, living beings are capable of moving themselves, of course. But the point is that even in this case, we can distinguish between a motive component in living beings, the, the soul, their form, and the moved component. Um, and motion is not regarded as some kind of a primitive status of bodies. It's always caused by something in the moved thing. And of course, Movement is, in a sense, always doomed to finish. Uh, this is a very schematic and elementary representation of movement in Aristotle. There is a moving cause, uh, and it is a cause of motion in an object from a status of privation to the end of motion. Of course, this cannot be applied to uh, natural bodies for the very simple reason that we cannot say that, for example, uh, simple bodies are living beings. 
there is no soul in them that acts as a moving cause. Um, the place is not a final cause, of course. And of course, the natural motion is not forced motion. So, but the thing is that even with all of this qualification, Aristotle does, does, doesn't say that this scheme doesn't hold for natural elementary motion. It makes supplements, qualifications, and so on. But this scheme is, after all, not, uh, not refuted, um, is not abandoned. Um, that's why, according to some interpreters, Aristotle um, regards something in the, in, the, in the simple bodies as playing more or less the same role as form in being a moving cause. And that's the rope in the Kaelo book four, that is the inclination or the nisus or nisus. Um, well, I will let now come back. I'm, I, of course, I will finish in a few, in a couple of minutes. I will come back to uh, a nice passage in uh, Carl Rovelli's article where he says, Unlike one of the reveries of this paper, I don't think that it is merely an analogy um, that is the, the analogy between natural and uh, motion and, so to speak, inertial motion. In my opinion, it's too much of an anachronism to think that Aristotelian bodies move naturally as a result of an internal nisus, that is the Aristotelian analog to a force constantly acting on the object. But I would say that, that they agree both with the referee and with Carlo Rovelli. So I, I um, strongly agree with Carlo Rovelli that the rope uh, in the Decaelo or the inclination in physics book eight is not uh, an internal force. The very idea of force is very problematic in Aristotle's physics. And uh, when the impetus theory uh, originates, it, is, it originates from different philosophical uh, presuppositions, those of Stoicism, those of Neoplatonism, but not those of Aristotle. At the same time, I would agree with the referee that in order to explain the motion of, 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 of elementary bodies, uh, Aristotle and the Aristotelian philosopher were, so to speak, forced to, um, to find a motive component in the elements. Uh, for example, Alexander of Aphrodisias talks about an inclination, an ephesis. Uh, we find this enigmatic reference to the rope. And this may be uh, a, 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 some kind of, of uh, a sign that uh, after all, Aristotle um, didn't abandon the scheme according to which uh, uh, every object, every moving object is moved by something else from a starting point to an ending point. Of course, it qualifies this scheme. It doesn't abandon this scheme. And that's why I would say that the parallel with Newton's first law uh, is, in a sense, slightly, slightly problematic, because when Aristotle talk about movement in void, it does so in order to say that movement in void cannot happen at all. And when he talks about uh, the natural motion of bodies, he adapts a scheme, which is the scheme according to which uh, motion as a starting point, an ending point, and an external uh, uh, moving cause. Um, so, but it's a, it's a limited question. I would uh, like to uh, thank once again Carlo Rovelli both for his article and for his presentation. Thank you, Ricardo. And I'm sure Carlo would love to respond straight away, but <laughs> I'm afraid I know. Um, I let's move on to Peter Adamson directly. Um, and save the responses and the discussion among the four of you um, for after a short break then. So Peter, please. Okay, so thanks a lot. So thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks to Carlo for the really interesting paper. Um, I'm relieved at the fact that the things I want to say haven't already been said by the previous two commenters, so I thought might happen. Um, so uh, let me see if I can get this to work. So that looks okay, right? Okay, so um, in this presentation, I want to argue for some good news and bad news from Carlo's point of view. So the good news is that his view of Aristotle, I think, is even more right than he says in a couple of ways. So I'm gonna give some uh, reasons to think that 
Aristotle's physics is even more counterintuitive than he says, and that Aristotle is not only arguing within a domain, but that in a sense he knows he's arguing within a domain. But then at the end, I want to suggest that there's some bad news as well, which is that precisely these points that make Carlos take on the status of Aristotle's physics true have as a consequence that Aristotle's physics is further away from modern physics than Carlo wants to say. So it's kind of complicated, but hopefully you'll see what I mean. So um, here's the, here are the uh, aspects of Carlo's paper, which is very rich and obviously is, has much more in it than I can really respond to, but I, I wanna respond to two claims that he makes in particular. One is that Aristotle's physics is not just intuitive. It's not just something you would kind of come up with uh, like off the top of your head. And in fact, it's arguably counterintuitive. And here, as we're gonna see, it's important to me that um, in opposition to what Ricardo just said, I think it's sometimes counterintuitive and not just non-intuitive, or at least, it might have counterintuitive implications if you think about it even briefly. So that's one thing I want to talk about. And I'm gonna talk about that by talking about Aristotelian chemistry. Then I wanna talk about this idea of um, the physical account being valid within a domain. The domain being the earthly realm that we're in where bodies are moving in fluids. And I want to basically point out that that's only half the story in Aristotle's physics, because in Aristotle's physics, there's actually two domains, not one. So first, let's talk about Aristotelian chemistry. So as I say, um, what, my, what I want to say here is that Aristotelian physics, insofar as it involves appeals to these four elements, which are characterized by the pairs hot and cold, wet and dry, is actually an, a very unintuitive account. Um, now, we might be kind of fooled into thinking that it's intuitive because, for example, there are other elemental systems in pre-modern cultures that seem to have developed completely independently. So notably, there's a five element theory in China, which is the same, except instead of air, you have um, wood and metal. And so you, you think, okay, well, people look around and think, what are things made of? They basically come up with this stuff, earth, fire, that kind of thing, right? But bear in mind that Aristotle did not invent that scheme. That comes to him from Empedocles. So what Aristotle brings to this is a different idea, which is that the elements are characterized by heavy and light, as we've heard, but more, most fundamentally by the pairs hot and cold, dry and wet. And this is not irrelevant to the stuff about motion. So for example, if you think about why, why do um, fire and earth move to the, out, the outside, the answer that you get in the Aristotelian tradition is because they're dry and dry things are faster. Um, this is based on some material in Aristotle. Maybe it's not a good take on Aristotle, but it's something you find in Arabic texts, for example. So wet in the middle, water and air, dry on the outside, earth and fire. Uh, now, so, the, so our picture is, well, we've got these four elements and they're so fire is hot and dry and so on, right? Well, is that intuitive? Well, clearly not. Because for one thing, none of us have ever seen these four elements. So you might think you have because you've seen a candle burning or you've seen a clod of earth. But as Carlo mentioned, the objects around us are always combinations of the four elements. None of us have ever experienced pure elements. So um, clearly it's not like an appeal to what pure fire or pure earth does because you can see it happening. You can't get, I mean, even if you take a ladle of water out of the sea, you're not dealing with pure water. Furthermore, these properties, hot and dry and wet and cold, sound like they're an appeal to things that are like intuitive and observable, like water is wet. But actually, um, I think in Aristotle and certainly in the Aristotelian tradition, to be hot is not to be hot to the touch. To be dry is not to be dry to the touch. Um, so you can't touch pure fire anyway, not just because it's too, too dangerous, but because you can't actually ever experience any. But furthermore, um, if you were touching hot, if you were touching pure fire, I don't think it would feel hot in Aristotelian physics. What does it mean for things to be hot and dry, cold and wet? Well, kind of unclear. 
Um, but if you look at the way that these pairings are used in scientific tradition in a broadly Aristotelian context, you find them, um, for example, in Galenic medicine, you find them uh, developing pharmacological theories according to which certain drugs are dry or cold. Um, and the only sense in which that's connected to anything observable is that maybe if you take a, a cooling drug, your body will cool down. But the drug, of course, is not cold. Even further away would be something like astrology or alchemy, where they say things like, the moon makes things moist. And they would say, well, think about the tides, that would be evidence for this. But actually, these four properties are standing in for something like a kind of theoretical, abstract, postulated system, none of which is observable, and none of which is even remotely intuitive. And in fact, the reason I'm saying it's counterintuitive is that um, when they actually spell out how this works, they sometimes explicitly say very surprising things. A good example of this being the late Byzantine philosopher Nikephoros Kumnos, who I'm sure you've all been waiting to hear about this evening. Uh, so Nikephoros was criticized for a controversial thing he said, which is that air is wetter than water. And his reasons for this were basically that he wanted to assign each of the four qualities to one of the four elements. So like earth is primarily dry, fire is primarily hot. And um, so he, he wound up having to say that water is primarily cold, which left air, because air is not cold at all, it's hot in the Aristotelian theory, which left air to be moist, primarily moist. What sense does this make? Well, what he says is, well, moist doesn't mean wet to the touch. Moist means fluid in the sense of being moldable, and air is more moldable than water, right? It's easier to move air around than to move water around, so it's wetter. Now, the fact that someone could even think about saying that within the Aristotelian context shows that Aristotelian chemistry is not an appeal to intuitive ideas about things like heat and wetness. Okay, so that's what I want to say about Aristotelian chemistry. So, uh, sorry, I know this is all very fast, but I don't have very long. Now let me say something about Aristotelian cosmology. So there, actually in Carlo's presentation tonight, there was sort of brief allusion to the idea that maybe we could think about heavenly motion as being a kind of very simple case of the, of the general theory of motion that we heard, like where most of the variables are gone. But I think that's not true. Um, so I think what's going on in Aristotle's physics is that there are two domains of physics, one of which, one in which you have things moving rectilinearly in fluids, and another in which you have things moving circularly, namely in the heavens. And the physical rules in these two domains are completely different. They have nothing in common. In fact, they're mostly defined in opposition to each other. So rectilinear versus circular, friction versus no friction, temporary as opposed to eternal, um, terminal points, like as Ricardo mentioned, something like earth or fire moves to a certain point and then stops, whereas obviously circular motion of the heavens goes around and around and around. The function of natural place is completely different because the heavens are not moving towards a natural place. At best, they're moving within a natural place. Um, and I could go on. So actually, when Carlo says, well, Aristotle is saying, it is talking about a set of laws of motion that's relevant to a context or a domain, not only is Carlo right, but Aristotle himself thinks that because he thinks there are two domains and that the rules in one domain just fall away in the other domain. They're no longer relevant. So actually I think this is extremely powerful evidence for that aspect of Carlo's um, thesis. And I would encourage, if, you, if you're presenting this in the future, I would encourage you to play this off. However, <laughs> um, uh, oh, and sorry, I wanted to say one other thing about this, which is that, um, this again is not obvious or even uncontentious because in the, in the uh, ancient period, there were philosophers who suggest like Plato or argue very strenuously, like some of the later Neoplatonists like Plotinus and Philoponus, that the same elements are constituting the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. And so what they were saying was, well, this, this must be wrong. There must be some kind of unified physics, which, captures both domains 
it's, it's wrong to split them into two domains. Um, so Plotinus, for example, has a really nice discussion of this where he says, well, fire is trying to move in a circle, but first it has to move up to where it's supposed to be orbiting in the natural sphere of fire. And only once it's um, done that, will it start moving in a circle, okay? So he thinks of the rectilinear motion of fire as just a kind of preparatory stage while it's moving towards its natural motion, which is circular, because the heavens are made of fire. Okay, so th that I take all to be in support of Carlo, except, in so I mean, the only sense in which all that was a criticism is that he's even more right than he thought he was. But I think there's some bad news on both accounts. So first of all, um, taking the chemistry point first, as I said, uh, although the hot, dry, cold, wet thing and the elemental theory is certainly counterintuitive, it's not observable. Uh, so if it's true that being hot in the sense that elements are hot doesn't mean being hot to the touch, then it means something else. And I guess that what it means is something like an un unobservable chemical property that can only be understood relative to the effects it causes. So for example, when you cool, thing, cool things down, they get more solid. When you heat things up, they get less solid, they disperse. So that, and that's really what heat and cold, dry and wet are. They're um, unobservable underlying properties that are supposed to explain observable properties. So actually hot, cold, wet, dry is much more like the properties that you see by reading off the periodic table in modern chemistry. Unfortunately, it's catastrophically wrong, right? So it's not true that there are four underlying chemical properties that explain um, observable properties of bodies. Um, that if it were, then that the periodic table would look like uh, would look like that, right? That would be the right periodic table here, but it's not. And uh, um, insofar as the chemical theory is underlying the theory, oops, sorry, I went too far. In so, insofar as the chemical theory is um, underlying the theory of motion, oh, sorry, I did it again, doesn't matter, because uh, I was almost done. Um, I think that's a problem for Carlo's thesis, um, both because it means that the theory is uh, less based on observation than he said, and also because the whole theory of motion is predicated on this idea of the elements and how they work, which is false, even if it predicts correct things about how motions actually transpire in fluids. As for the cosmology point I wanted to make, um, I mean, although it's true that what I said bears out Carlo's thesis about physics being relative to domain, um, you could argue that when, I mean, Galileo says he's an Aristotelian because he says he's using Aristotelian methods as he learned in Padua, right? But one of the profoundly un-Aristotelian things that Galileo does is to put serious pressure on the idea that there are two domains. For example, he showed that there are astro astronomical phenomena that could be seen with telescopes that change and are beyond the sphere of the moon he showed that the moon is not a perfect sphere, right? So he, he gave empirical evidence that Plato and Philoponus had been right and that there should be one physics for the whole cosmos and not two physicses, one for the sublunary realm and one for the heavens. And he actually is not unique even in his own period and place. So it, this is a feature of the late Italian Renaissance that philosophers like Telesio and Campanella as well as Galileo were saying, we need to get away from this Aristotelian idea that physics um, is completely context relative or domain relative, and that there's one set of rules for down here and one set of rules for up there. We should say that up there, everything's made of the same stuff and obeys the same rules. But if, if it does obey the same rules, we need new rules because Aristotle's theory of motion doesn't explain heavenly motion and was never intended to, right? And so I think actually, to get to modern physics, this is something that did have to be dropped from Aristotelian physics. Uh, modern physics has one physical account for the whole perceptible universe rather than two sets of laws, one for the sublunary realm and one for the realm of the heavens. And so um, 
in that respect, this point about domain specificity, although it's in a way friendly to what Carla was saying, it is in a way problematic for what Carla was saying, because it shows that actually there is an aspect of Aristotelian physics, although it's a less obvious aspect, which needs to be overcome and defeated in order for modern physics to succeed. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Peter. And thanks again to all three respondents. I'm sure we will have much to discuss after a very short break. Um, I would suggest we all come back at 7.25. So we'll have five minutes of a break um, so we can make the maximum of the discussion period. I'll see you in five minutes then. OK, then. Um... Let's uh, all gather again um, for a um, for discussion. Um, we're scheduled until eight. We can go a little bit beyond that. No one's going to turn off the conference, but not too much beyond that, of course, because people also want to um, go home um, um, for dinner and all that. So we're going to start, of course, with um, discussion between the four speakers. But um, those in the audience who want to ask questions are encouraged to already um, yes, um, mention that in the chat. So just put a question mark there in the chat if you want to ask a question, maybe with a one or two word explanation on what the question is about. So we can maybe um, combine those if possible. Certainly, if even a small fraction of the people here ask the question, not everybody is going to be able um, to ask that. So um, be aware of that you probably um, won't get to ask a question, but we encourage everybody to send the questions or reflections they might have on this event to us by email afterwards. Um, and we will then see, um, yeah, think about the best format in which to continue this discussion, both in future events, um, but possibly also um, in some other form. But um, let me turn now right away um, to uh, Carlo Rovelli, who I'm sure would like to say a few words on the responses he's just received, and then um, we'll take it from there. So please go ahead, Carlo. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandra. So um, first of all, uh, I'm going to say something briefly about that, because I, I mean, I wish with each one of you I was there and we could sit at dinner and go through each one of these points in details. Uh, I mean, I was, but that's not appropriate. I think I would just to uh, make a few points, um, which I think uh, could be good for discussion. Second, um, I have been uh, listening and mostly uh, no objection on anything I've heard, uh, but it's a little bit more than that. I'm a physicist, so most of my, you know, uh, competence is about Newton and Einstein and, 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 and Heisenberg, not about Aristotle. So when I uh, find a disagreement between something I read in Aristotle or something you tell me is in Aristotle, I, my, my default idea is that you're right and wrong because uh, obviously just because, uh, I mean, if we were talking about quantum mechanics and it would make the opposite assumption to, 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 as a default assumption. So that's the context. Um, given that, let me try to respond to uh, some of the point of each of you said, the, uh, the ones that I marked as uh, that, that uh, I think are more interesting uh, for possible discussion, uh, going backwards. So uh, I'll start from Peter, uh, which it, it was the last one to talk, uh, because it's either easier to me, it's closer to my memory, then I, I walk back rather than going back and forth. Um, uh, regarding Peter, uh, I, I want to make one comment, uh, but it's a crucial, and in a sense, it's perhaps a, the key point for me. Of, of the entire discussion. Uh, Peter um, had some good news and some bad news. Uh, I, I, I certainly agree with everything he said about the two domains. I uh, misplayed that in that in, in, in the presentation. He, it's, it's, it's a, and also the historical evolution of the two domain, one domain thing. Uh, uh, but at some point he said, well, there's bad news. Look, in Aristotle and, and he had specifically uh, the chemistry, there is something which is just catastrophically wrong. And as such, it was uh, uh, an impediment for... Um... And that Peter presented as bad news for me because I claimed that uh, Aristotle's theory is right. Now, I agree and disagree. Uh, of course, in... in, in uh, Aristotle did something catastrophically wrong. I mean, who would deny that? Um, 
But I never said that uh, uh, Aristotle theory is right, period. I said Aristotle theory is right in the same sense in which Newton theory is right, okay? And in Newton theory, there's something which is catastrophically wrong, as anybody who has studied general relativity knows very well. I mean, take all the basics of Newton theory, the three basic laws of nature. Take any of the fundamental conceptual structure of Newton is just false, badly false in uh, general relativity or slightly false. For instance, Newton says that if there's no force acting on something, something which moves with uniform motion, uh, 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 rectilinear at constant velocity, this is just false. It doesn't, okay? Because in general relativity, this is just not, not true. Uh, things follow geodesics and can go around in circles and, 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 and so forth. There's no forces acting on that. So I'm not saying, look, the conceptual scheme that uh, Aristotle proposed, uh, it's right in its foundations and it stays the same and it's also true now. No, I say that postgraduate screen had aspects that evolved and, and were historically evolved into but there were also aspects which were abandoned by Galileo and by Kepler, by Copernicus. In fact, by aspects were abandoned by, uh, 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 by Ptolemy, by Archimedes, by all sorts of people in between. But violently in, 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 in the Renaissance, we were thrown away badly. Uh, and I think was readjusted in a way, exactly in the same way in which the foundation of Newtonian physics has been um, uh, thrown away by uh, general relativity or by uh, 20 years later, by uh, 10 years later, by quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, or even before by Maxwell, uh, by Maxwell theory. So I do agree that there is something catastrophically wrong in uh, um, in Aristotle physics, and I do agree that, but I also claim that there is something catastrophically wrong in Newton theory. It's both conceptually and factually. I mean, Mercury doesn't follow. Uh, uh, and that uh, progress is made when we change this aspect that we later see it uh, catastrophically wrong, like, you know, uh, 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 simultaneity is well defined for instance. And um, so uh, I think the observation is right, but it doesn't contradict what I was saying. It's reinforced what I was saying. That's uh, what I want to say. Um, and that's my main comment about Peter. Let me, I, I don't want to take too much time. So let me um, go to um, Ricardo's uh, comments. Um, uh, just, just a few observations. Uh, one is uh, 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 a couple of things that I found very, very, very fascinating what uh, Ricardo said. One is that uh, I certainly uh, sort of probably never thought sufficiently about that, that um, Ricardo comment about predictive, how predictive it's um, Aristotelian physics. And my, uh, my first reaction, which is wrong, uh, it was, well, it is predictive. Uh, it, it, it allows me to predict things. Uh, I, I can make a list, but the, the, the easiest list, the easiest um, example I can do is that uh, it, it allows me to predict something which is wrong, right? It is what, uh, um, what uh, uh, Archimedes found out. Namely, if I take a piece of metal and I shape it in a suitable way, I put it in water, Aristotelian physics predict it goes down. It doesn't, it stays up, it floats. So uh, the fact that it, give, it predicts something wrong shows that it does predict things. Um, but then what Ricardo says is, wait a minute, it's, it's not so much that the theory is not predictive. It, the, the interesting point is that uh, um, Aristotle is not very interested in prediction. And that's bingo, that's right on the point. It's true, it's not very interesting in prediction. In fact, it doesn't talk much about prediction precisely because uh, um, he's in, interested in, um, um, in something else. And then Ricardo made a nice po point is that, well, what about contemporary science? And here, I think he touched something really uh, uh, profound. 
uh, there is a lot of emphasis in predictivity in contemporary science. We came out because of the need of a demarcation criterion between science and not science. So we call science a thing which is predictive. And because in modern science, pre predictability has been the key tool for checking good theory from a bad theory. But um, I think has, science has never been interested in predictions, has been interested in understanding and making sense of what goes on. Take general relativity, which is my favorite theory because I you know, spent all my life in it. General relativity predicts that Mercury moves a little bit different than, uh, um, than what is predicted by Newton theory. And in fact, it's right. Uh, Mercury moves the way predicted by general relativity and not the way predicted. But I mean, who cares about you know, the detail of the perihelion of Mercury moving a little bit, a fraction of a, of a degree every century. Is that so interesting? No. The prediction is a tool to give confidence in a profound reformulation of the way we, do, we, 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 we look at nature, which includes Newtonian theory in a limit, but it gives us a completely wider understanding of, uh, of phenomena. So I would say um, uh, certainly it's a profound difference between um, Newtonian physics and uh, sorry, Aristotelian physics and modern physics, the fact that predictivity plays so much an enormous role, definitely so in, uh, in um, modern physics uh, and not in, uh, in Aristotle. This is one of the, of the differences. Um, but careful because predictivity is not, I would say the, it, it's a tool in modern physics, not the object uh, of the game. Um, and even more, it's, an, it, it's in a similar direction. In fact, I would, it's sort of a similar comment, but uh, um, uh, Ricardo gave, in my opinion, a brilliant discussion of mathematics and uh, but particularly an idea of mathematics. And, uh, and I loved it. I, 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 I thought it was, it was extremely insightful. So in a sense, I can summarize, uh, it's much more closer to modern physics, the Pythagorean or, or, or the Platonian, Platonic, uh, Platonian, the, 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 the academy um, uh, emphasis on mathematics for understanding the world, which is not, was not uh, empty. I mean, after all, astronomy came out from that, right? And, and that's great science. All the Alexandrian astronomy came out from the academy, not from the Lyceum. Um, but, uh, it's attached to Pythagora and, uh, um, and, and Plato, an idea that uh, mathematics is the essence of things, uh, so, which from the perspective of modern methodology, it's the wrong kind of question. Um, and when uh, Aristotle looks at nature and based an, an, an observation, um, I mean, of course, Aristotle is also asking what is the essence of things, but uh, when he sort of, uh, 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 leaves mathematics apart and, and discards the uh, Platonic idea that mathematics is things in a way. Um, he's definitely making a move uh, which is uh, uh, historically crucial, I would say, to the to the uh, um, to, to the burn of modern science. Alexandrian astronomy did not develop just because you know Aristotle, uh, because Plato said, "Well, can we describe the uh, the movement of the body in terms of circles?" Uh, but also because uh, uh, you know somebody started to take very precise observations about the the, the position of the of the um, of the bodies, so that I I uh, that I think is uh, uh, it's brilliant because once again, I mean one thing that Ricardo says is well, uh, uh, Galileo is uh, it's certainly Platonic in his use of mathematics and his rhetoric and he refers to that explicitly. Uh, but he's not asking what is the essence of the numbers, and he's not asking whether uh, he says mathematics is a language for understanding. It is a tool, um, and and uh, and I find this is modern physics uh, 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 again. Uh, I, uh, Newton says hypothesis non fingos. I mean, discarding um, questions about the essence of things and going to the uh, observation and making account, accounting uh, for the observation has been a trend uh, of which certainly Aristotle did not complete it, but certainly um, played a role in the, in, the, in, in the importance of the observation. Okay, I don't want, I, I, I would have had other things to say, um, 
about uh, what Ricardo said. Um, well, maybe just one. I, I understood the point about uh, natural motion being also framed in Aristotle in a, um, let me use a wrong word, uh, a causal story about what, what um, well, I understand it. Uh, so I, fine, I learned it uh, and I understand. Um, I think my claim was weaker, much weaker. Historically, the idea of distinguishing two kinds of motions, natural and violent, um, has given a tool for dealing with motion, I even if both of them are in Aristotle in a, in a larger uh, uh, sort of explanational structure or larger metaphysical understanding. Uh, but this distinction is a tool for separating two kinds of phenomena that we see. And it has played a role. It is this distinction that plays a role in Newton. It's not that in Newton, uh, the, 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 of course, the, uh, the rectilinear motion is the natural motion of Aristotle. Of course not, they're very different. Uh, but Newton used the idea of distinguish these two motions, which is not there. You don't find it in Copernicus or even in Galileo. I, I, Galileo has this idea that again, there is a natural circular motion. He tries to be, to make sense and the uh, Galileo object, of course, is make sense of Copernicanism. So getting rid of the, if the earth is part of the sky, then we don't, we cannot have two different physics. Um, and, uh, and and he tries to use the notion of, uh, uh, but in the in the in the dialogue is very confusing because the natural motion is still still circular. He tries to use the circular motion on Earth. Um, but what I say is that historically, this idea of uh, addressing physics by saying, "Look, um, within physics, we can describe uh, how one body act on another, or something act on something else, and call this a force or or." or, or or, or, or violent, um, or, or the cause of violent motion from something which is uh, 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 determined by the place, determined by uh, by something else, which we call natural motion. It's a, uh, it's still there, and if 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 it is less visible in uh, Newtonian physics, it's striking in the motion of object in general relativity, because the motion of object in general relativity it resembles dramatically the movement in a, in a gravitational field. Okay, so last comment, uh, 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 very brief about um, something that Gottfried uh, said, just very, very brief, briefly. Um, the, uh, he insisted of you, the, the, the fact that, uh, and, and I found very interesting, his uh, sort of historical motivation of Aristotle as, as, as a response to um, uh, the, the atomist and the Eleatics on, on, on the other side, um, that's, that's something which I, you know, I, I listen with interest. Um, and in doing that, taking the fluids as a model. Now, the fact that the fluid, that it's about fluids, it's, um, it's an idea which I, I'm not sure, but I think I got from Monica uh, Ugalia, uh, the first who insisted so much about, uh, uh, about that. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard from her before or less, but somehow it's, it's exactly, I mean, I, I had looked at the De Cielo in the past, uh, but when in 1914, I, I read De Cielo again and, uh, and, and I looked at the physics uh, and uh, it didn't make any sense before the entire story. But when somehow the fluid came out, uh, just suddenly it made it, everything make sense. So, I mean, this is uh, not, on the, not on the heavens, but on the, the part of the of the Australian physics, which on the on, on the earth, this makes perfectly sense. Now we understand what is going on there. It's a domain of the motion of things in, 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 immersed in uh, um, uh, in fluids. And uh, last point, um, uh, Goffrey was very brief on that because he didn't had uh, much time. And it's a principle of predominance. Um, I I had not appreciate that, but definitely this is a. a this is a crucial uh, uh, element, um, way of understanding nature, which is, uh, um, it's very, which Galileo has very clear. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and you don't find it all in, in, in Aristotle, namely that when two causes in the sense, in the specific uh, 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 case of, of physical modern language forces act, uh, 
uh, somehow Aristotelian logic is naturally one of the two prevails. And that's definitely wrong from the point of modern physics. In fact, all the examples in the natural motions, uh, there is a, there, there seem to be just one, uh, one. I, I don't, I don't know the details uh, of that, uh, but certainly um, uh, Galileo has a very good understanding of how um, uh, forces combine. Um, I'll just stop here. Uh, there are many other points which I marked on my on my notebook, and I would like to discuss more in detail. But I pointed out the the few one where I would uh, sort of uh, either object or view a little bit differently, and I'm. Very much looking forward for uh, for the discussion. Yes. So, please, who of our three responders would like to go first, if any, to uh... um, go ahead? Maybe, maybe I could just say something brief about the chemistry point and the sense in which it's wrong. <laughs> so, what I get what I meant was that um, I mean, there's there's sort of two ways that something can be wrong. One is the way that the account of sublunary motion is wrong. And the way that Newton is wrong with respect to Einstein, namely that it's it's right but limited or right within a domain or it's a, a good approximation or something. And then there's another way of being wrong, which is like what we associate with, say, phlogiston, right? So maybe even a, like a good idea in principle, but there's nothing to it whatsoever. And what I was what I wanted to say about the four element theory is that it's it's right in terms of what it's trying to do, namely identify the underlying chemical properties of observable physical phenomena, but it's not true at all. So it's not that it's sort of true, like within a domain or anything like that. And, and then what I, so what I wanted to say is that although you're right that the motion, the account of motion is true within a domain, if it's based on something that's not true at all, not even within a domain, then that's sort of that's an additional reason to find it problematic. Does that make sense? I don't think there's anything which is true not in a domain. I mean, in <clears throat> it's simultaneity being well defined true in any domain. Well, but no. my point is that the the element the like the theory of the contrarieties, hot and cold and wet, wet and dry, isn't true at all. I'm not saying that some things can be absolutely true without being true relative to, to a domain. I'm saying that pick your pick whatever domain you want. The hot, cold, wet, dry thing is just false in every domain, including the one Aristotle meant it to be true in. It's just wrong. But but uh, but on the other hand, like I said, it's it's like a good shot at something that that is a good idea. The project is good because what you really want is something like the periodic table, right? And that's that was his shot at it. But it's not like it's kind of like the periodic table, the way that Newtonian physics is sort of like a specification of the relativistic world. Like if you bracket out certain effects, then Newtonian physics is correct. There's nothing you can bracket out that makes hot, cold, wet, dry come out true. That's my point. Um, well, maybe we could continue on that. I, I, I think within Newtonian theory, I think which just falls. I just conceptual structure which are there that need to support some phenomenology which works uh, within a domain. It's not that they're true within a domain, mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is uh, maybe we're not so far in what we're saying. Um, I mean, I guess the, the real insight I wanted to offer is that the thing we miss when we look at the chemical theory is that we think that hot means hot, and it doesn't. Yeah. No, that, that's I, I, that's, I, the main, I, that's really the main thing I wanted and to that, say. And that I, I also understand that in the and, and I, I completely appreciate it with uh, the counterintuitive aspect. <laughs> yeah, right. Of the that definitely yeah, that's, what's, that's sort of what's good about it. Yeah. 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 And 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 come on, it, in, in that sense, uh, the certainly wrong things in the in, in the statements about about the world. But you no, know, this is a the Kuhnian idea that you. Uh, the previous theory is just wrong. It is wrong. Uh, well, I, I don't want to go more into that. that. I, mean, I, I wish we had a one hour, two hours, three hours. To just I mean, if you through. want to go on for, for a few more minutes, please. I mean, there's a... 
No, well then maybe, um, yeah, Gottfried Heimann would like to, please go ahead. I should add, um, add a little aspect to the last point. Namely, what, of course, in the sense, in the sense for element theory and, and this stuff is wrong, but uh, what is it for a theory about theoretical entities to be wrong? That's quite, that's quite a question. Are there such things as point masses in Newtonian physics? If there are, the theory is totally wrong. It is even incoherent, of course, because uh, those uh, objects must have an uh, infinite density, uh, which, uh, which can't exist. What about uh, Galileo's law of circular, uh, of, uh, circular motion as, in, as, as inertial? Is it wrong? No, it serves a purpose within a theoretical context. And then we can have a look at, the, then we can ask how good does it serve that purpose? First on the one hand, and on the other hand, is this complete purpose or this complete context so tenable or not? And of course it is not, the Aristotle, the Aristotelian um, context is not tenable as a whole. But you cannot, it is this on this is on rosin picking. You, you pick out this is fine and that's not. And so and I think this makes this makes not very much sense. Okay, Rovelli's uh, project, of course, it was a little bit different. Namely, here we have a fragment of a theory in physics, in, in, in this discussion of the void about falling bodies. And then we can look, is this theory has it has this theory an object has a certain realm of, of validity. And I think uh, it has, and, of, uh, and this was Carlos' uh, point that it has. But um, we, I think the question, did he get, how much did he get right? Is not a very good question uh, about, uh, about a, a very um, old, a, a, a very early science. Um, it is a good question, of course, of contemporary science. Did Maxwell, did, uh, did, uh, did the predecessors of Einstein get certain equations right? Did Maxwell, was, what about symmetry, for instance, of, uh, in Einstein's uh, 1905 paper on special, uh, on special relativity? Did Maxwell get the symmetry because these two cases, one is moving and the other is moving, right or not? That's a good question and then do it better. But the question, did he get it right, makes only sin sense in the context of making it better oneself. And we are not in a position to make anything better than Aristotle made. Anyone respond? Or... Maybe Peter should, should I, I agree. Peter, I mean, exactly, yeah. You want to yeah. 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 If you, yeah, I mean, I guess what, what I wanted to suggest is that in a way, um, if you recognize the, the elemental properties theory as an attempt to identify underlying chemical properties of composite substances, then that gives you enough of a connection to, you know, the, the kind of elemental theory that emerged in the 19th century that then you can compare them. That was my point in a way, is to recognize the commonality of project precisely so that it makes sense to ask your question, is it right? And then the answer is, well, no, because what we want is something like electron shells and not hot and cold, right? But so maybe to, uh, um, to slowly move on um, to the general discussion, but to, I mean, I, this, could, this could go on for a while. I do wanna, um, Pose then the question to all of you. Um, now that we're talking about this right, 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 and wrong, right, um, the question that we raised in the beginning about, and which Carlo also raised in his talk. So, would Aristotle, if he returned to Earth, um, have viewed 
these contemporary physical theories that see um, his theory in some domains as an approximation, would he have endorsed it or not? Just as a uh, provocative question to wrap up uh, the discussion. Does one of you want to give that a shot? Let me try very, very shortly. Um, uh, not being a scholar of Aristotle and trying to read his books, um, the impression I get is something spectacularly intelligent. I mean, it's, it's just totally impressive. I mean, it's, a, it's very hard to pinpoint him saying something silly. It's just all over an explosion of uh, intelligence. So I, I would astonished if uh, by you know, a new machine, he would uh, come to the modern world and, uh, and, and um, I mean, he would be shocked and, uh, and, and had to learn a lot, but he wanted to learn and he would just love it. Why not? Well, maybe better a satisfactory answer to the questions that he brought to the table. I think that's maybe. Um... So I, I think one, th one thing to, to consider is, might he be also disappointed? I think he'd be very impressed by things like airplanes, but um, uh, I think he would be totally shattered to discover what we think knowledge is. So, I mean, the, like we've been talking about his science, but we haven't really talked about his philosophy of science and his philosophy of science is presented in the posterior analytics. And the, I think actually, in some ways, the break between, in fact, in a way, this is what Carlo's paper shows, the break between Aristotle's science and modern science isn't so much the science part, it's the philosophy of science part. Because Aristotle thinks that science should be necessary, universal, essential, eternal, yada, 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 right? Whereas uh, modern science isn't any of those, at least, or, I mean, this, again, would be a long discussion, but arguably, modern science isn't any of those. So I think he would probably look at modern science and say, well, you gave up on the project I had in mind. And, you know, I, I, I'm chagrined that it turned out that that was the key move, right? That you were like, the, the key thing was to stop worrying about universal necessity and start worrying about, you know, what I can observe here in the lab, uh, contingents, changing, Thing. So something like evolution, right, would be the obvious example, but it, it's, it's, it's pervasive throughout the contrast between modern science and Aristotelian science. So I think he would say, in a way, he would think that what we were doing was brilliant, and I'm sure that he would welcome it and think it was awesome. But I think he would think, oh, well, okay, but that's not what I meant. It was after episteme, and what you seem to have decided is that episteme about the physical world is not possible. So that's too bad. So do you mean the Probably provisional wanna... aspect of of the, the way we, we view knowledge provisionally today, that would she would yeah. uh, and the fact that everything's it. only contingently true, right? That would for him be like totally mind boggling, I think, because that's one of the few things that, um, you know, unites Plato and Aristotle is they both think that um, knowledge has to be of things that could not be false, not, could not possibly be false. And we have given up on that. We gave up on that sort of around late medieval, the one that starts to wear off. So thank you for that. Let's get a few questions from the audience and in at least in like a, another 50 minutes or so. Um, but I think we've certainly raised quite a few questions um, and potential for future discussions. But so then our first question from the audience is from Sebastian. Um, so if you want to briefly turn on your video, Sebastian, and ask your question to our discussants, please. Right. Uh, thanks, Carlo, for like, the, the talk. It was wonderful. Uh, I wanted to continue on this topic of like approximation or like this topic of approximation or giving like an account within, within a specific domain uh, because it came, and especially on the side of the good news uh, following like Peter's uh, response, uh, because there's like this famous point made by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, I think it's book one, where it says basically that we should not expect more precisions than is allowed by a subject matter. And of course, like for politics or ethics and various other domains, like we probably should not expect uh, our language to capture uh, in full, as it were, like the phenomenon that we're interested in. And in a way, I would, I would expect that it could be even more good news for you, Carlo, 
if Aristotle, for the domain of like terrestrial, terrestrial bodies, would also grant that we cannot speak uh, with as much precision as we, as we might want to. Uh, and therefore that we actually are not only restricted to a specific domain, but also uh, to a specific like, regime of approximation in terms of like how precise can we be when it comes to like terrestrial bodies. So if you could say something about that, I, I think that could maybe give a light on the fact that you might be actually even in a better position than that Peter said. Yeah, um, yeah, I, uh, yes, so uh, this is a, this, uh, this crucial comment that he, he, he makes when, uh, Aristotle makes when, when he talks about the different, uh, different areas of, of, of different sciences, to use this word, um, uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, um, we should talk with a level of, of, uh, of uh, of precision permitted by it, so it's uh, it, it seemed to be aware that there is a. Um, now I am not sufficient a, a, a Aristotelian scholar to 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 fully unravel the extent in which he he meant that in the sense you're saying uh, it might be or or, or might not. Others in this panel know better than me, but from a the anachronistic contemporary perspective, uh, yes, I mean that's. Um, that might even be a, a, a possible attempt to respond to, 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 to Sebastian. I don't know whether uh, Aristotle would have said that in, in somehow in the, the level of precision that we, or rigor, that we need, or we, we, we can achieve, uh, evolve historically, and, and therefore there is a, there is a change in, uh, um, there's a, I, I would say, a, an improvement in the way we, we understand phenomena. But certainly from a, from, a modern, uh, uh, from a modern perspective, that's exactly, that's exactly how, I view the, how I view the things. Namely, uh, Aristotelian physics is, uh, uh, you know, as good as a description as you can get with the level of precision that you have um, um, uh, with the cultural technology and knowledge and, and of the, of, of, of the fourth century. Does one of the three others want to add something to that? Or if not, then we'll move on to the next question, um, which is by, so uh, Mike said he wants to be last in queue. Um, so Adrian, um, please turn on your video and ask your question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my, my, my question was a little bit, um, yeah, speculative in the sense that um, it was prompted by uh, Peter's last, last objection about how uh, modern physics needed uh, to kind of do away with the two domain uh, separation in order for it to develop, and that may very well be true. Um, I guess it prompted me to think what can the whole Aristotelian, since today's evening is, is premised on the idea of you know, what lessons or, or what, what is it that Aristotle seemed to have got right? What may, what lessons, if any, uh, may be had about uh, the two domains contemporary physics seems to be operating within? Uh, I've put GR and QFT in, in, in parentheses, but what I mean really by there is, are the scales of the very, very small and the very, very large. Oh, you want to? Go ahead, Carla. It seems a question that's directed at you. Um, we are in the opposite uh, <clears throat> sort of methodological assumptions, of course. Uh, so uh, after after Copernicus and Newton, Newton and Copernicus pose a problem in a sense, which is, um, uh, uh, as Peter mentioned, so was not new. I mean, first of all, Copernicus ideas are much older than Copernicus, and then the idea of uh, challenging the distinction between the two, um, the heavens and the earth, is ancient. Uh, but Newton definitely resolved it fantastically by showing that you know Kepler laws and uh, uh, Galileo's laws are just uh, 
particular cases of solutions of, of Newton's laws. Uh, so we are in the we are in the in the in the mind frame that uh, the, 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 there is a way of describing all phenomena. There should be a way of describing all phenomena which is coherent and consistent, um, even mathematically. This is an assumption, but this assumption that has worked so well so long that we keep using it, and I don't see reasons for challenging it. There have been some suggestions, well, why don't we challenge it? Maybe there are different, maybe there is no unity of nature in the sense of a coherence between, uh, um, that's a very wild speculation, which I don't, I don't, uh, one of the points is that, um, a result distinction of the two, of the two domains is, doesn't imply any contradiction. It, it's coherent that the cosmos is separated into parts uh, which have different um, natural motions. Uh, it's not coherent that uh, the modern physics description of the world uh, um, is described at large scale in, 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 in by, by say GR, classical GR at the, the smaller scale of quantum mechanics. So we, we, people have tried to articulate a, uh, well, maybe there are two domains, but it doesn't, it, it, it seems to bring uh, contradictions. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's, a, it's an a priori that uh, scientists don't want to consider, but I think it's a, uh, it's a very natural uh, uh, hope that there is no contradiction in, 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 in the laws of physics that appear to, to work so well in, in, uh, in, in domains and therefore we can find a, a coherent quantum description of gravity. Um, and uh, the few people who have tried to challenge that don't seem to have got anywhere. So that's where we are, in my opinion. Does one of the three others want to say something about the coherence of Aristotle's domain separation? independently, of course, of how it relates to... Uh, yes, please, Ricardo Pagana, please go ahead. No, just two words about what Peter said about, uh, um, uh, of course, it was necessary to abandon Aristotle's dis distinction so that modern theory could, could uh, originate. Still, can we say that people like Teles and Campanella are precondition for modern physics? What they I am very skeptical about this. Telesio and Campanella are closer to Empedocles than to Aristotle, I would say. They develop very interesting and fascinating views about nature with no observations at all. And they are, and by the way, Galileo was unhappy at all with Campanella. So once again, it might be that a certain view, which is of course correct from a very general, in a general, in a general perspective, does not or closer to modern size than Aristotle's view does not necessarily uh, mark a, 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 an advance vis-a-vis -vis Aristotle. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think that Galileo would say, um, would, would, would regard uh, Campanella with the same respect he devotes to Aristotle, for example. So um, I would be cautious on this. Even if the general view is, of course, uh, a prerequisite for modern physics. Yeah, I, th I think to, uh, Telesio and Campanella, Bruno also, they're, they're more relevant as a sign of that something was shifting in terms of attitudes towards the domain, the double domain. Absolutely. Yeah. I, actually, one other thought I would have about the double domain, which I, I actually meant to say in my little presentation, is that in some ways, the heaven, the whole motion of the heavens, is more like as if there were some really amazing animals that lived higher than we do because they're self-moving or something. I mean, it's not exactly clear how that's working, right? But it's not for nothing that later on the, um, the, the Aristotelian tradition like Avicenna, for example, they start to have the idea of postulating souls in the heavens and intellects and souls, right? So, so maybe one way of thinking about what's happening there is that the thing that we have in our domain that obeys the same general rules as heavenly motion is zoology, which would be very surprising, but actually zoology is a closer, or, or psychology, 
is a more relevant science for understanding heavenly motion in Aristotle than physics, um, or at least physics as we know it from like you know the the, the discussion of motion. Um, and in fact, that the, the later tradition is aware of that, so they they say, well, once you get to heavenly motion and start thinking about it, that leads you into thinking about psychology. And that's why psychology is the bridge between natural philosophy and theology, right? So that's a, a very common idea you get in the medieval tradition. So, it, so the it's maybe maybe there is a kind of anchor for the scientific study of the heavens in the sublunary world, but it's not in things like falling rocks, and it's in things like me getting up and walking across the room. You want to add something, or you? Yeah. Can, can I make a can I make a, a, a comment in a different direction? Um, uh, it, we have the text uh, by Ptolemy, um, which is what half a millennium after uh, Aristotle, and uh, um, in 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 the in the beginning, the first part of the text, there is a discussion about whether the Earth moves or not, um, and uh, so there's a, there's a mention of the possibility that. That it rotates, and of course we we know that it was discussed. We have in in, in Archimedes the the Aristarchus idea that the Earth goes around the Sun, and its implication. And there's one passage in Ptolemy where he says, "Look, um, there is a there is this possibility." In fact, Ptolemy doesn't really discard it entirely, so it ends up by saying it it would complicate things to try to view that way more than what we are capable of doing, which is correct. Um, but the point I want to make is that uh, uh, Ptolemy says explicitly, if, if that hypothesis is correct, that the Earth is rotating and moving, and goes around the sun, which is not, he, he, he definitely discussed uh, extensively the possibility of, of, of the Earth rotating, uh, then we would have to revise uh, uh, Aristotelian physics, uh, and it obviously also because, uh, uh, because of the distinction um, um, uh, between the heavens and the and and, and so uh, everybody read Ptolemy. I mean, Ptolemy was is just one of the most read books in the, the science, and uh, uh, so it was uh, plainly on the table since a millennium that uh, this possibility is open, and uh, uh, among the various uh, challenge to uh, uh, to Aristotelian physics, uh, the, the the many one that came out both in antiquity, I mean, with Ptolemy himself, with Archimedes, many others, and all the way through the Middle Ages, like Buridanos and so on, uh, this, 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 thing, this distinction could have, should, and when Copernicus gave strong arguments that uh, for, for, for the Aristarchus system, and, 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 and then contemporary of, 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 um, uh, of Galileo was, of course, Kepler, who, who actually made it much better. And for the first time, it was much more effective in predictions. Then the urgency of the of getting rid of the separation um, was more and more was more and more clear. I guess what I'm saying is that it's a long, it was always on the table. It's not, it was not uh, something completely new in, in, in the Renaissance, the idea, certainly in the Renaissance, it was it, it beca because of Copernicus, I suppose, not because of other reasons. Um, the, the, the idea, if the earth goes around the sun, then it's a part of the sky. And if it's a part of the sky, then the same rules that, that other celestial bodies obey should be uh, obeyed on earth. So that's just a comment. Good, thank you. Um, I think um, we, we need to start wrapping up. Um, it's been very rich, at least for me, and I hope we can, so Maria, for example, won't get to ask her question, but she um, thankfully posted that a long question in the chat, which we can then um, um, read later on, copy it down. Um, also, Mike didn't get to ask his question, so at least I'm going to pass over to him to wrap this up um, and send us all home. Um, thanks for me, Mike, I'll give the closing words to you. Thank you, Alex. It's been a, it's been a wonderful session indeed. Uh, I, 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 as we as the organizers had frankly hoped, I think even more uh, illuminating and enjoyable uh, than your learned presentations was the discussion that came afterwards. This is precisely what we hoped for, and we weren't sure it was going to be possible for to have people from such uh, very different backgrounds be able to talk to each other rather than past each other. 
Uh, but it's clearly happening. And uh, I think that some very interesting ideas have come out in this discussion. If I had one question I wanted to leave you with, it was um, it would be to return to this very important question of, in what sense can we say that Aristotle was wrong? Uh, um, Peter raised at least a couple of senses in which something could be said to be wrong. Um, Gottfried Heinemann questioned whether uh, that is an appropriate uh, uh, kind of distinction to make. And I would suggest that maybe we could add another uh, question to the question of uh, to the, that of whether a given Aristotelian doctrine is right or wrong. And that is, is it fruitful or not? Is it fecund? Uh, for instance, to go back to the question of the elements uh, and the, clearly that's wrong. And yet when you come to the Arabic world with people like Jabir ibn Hayyan, he, uh, Use, starts off from that basis of this, uh, the four elements and their four primary qualities, and he develops a, a quantitative calculus, right? The, the, the science of the balance. So on the basis of this mistaken premise, Javier Ibn Hayyan adds something to Aristotelianism which was lacking, and that is its quantitative nature, as Carlo pointed out. So the, the methodological question that arises there is, What's the, what's the role of mistakes? Can science be uh, substantially advanced by mistakes? Are, ne are mistakes necessary for the progress of science? Those are your closing words, I take it, Mike? Yes. Um, then let me thank all of those that uh, took part in this. Um, I am... Um, Yes, we'll, we'll certainly be sending um, out a follow-up to all of you, but we also very much, I think, welcome feedback from all of you on this, since, as we said in the beginning, right, it was also experimental in trying as a, as a method to address certain questions about science that we're interested in. So please, um, both from the um, speakers and from the attendees, do send us long or short reflections on this. Those would be very much appreciated. Um, for now, I'm going to say... Goodbye and thank you in the name of all three of us, of uh, Katya, Mike, and myself. Um, I wish you a wonderful evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you very much um, for sticking with us and for putting so much effort into this. It's been a real pleasure. Yes, thank, thank you. Much. And do stay thank in touch much. about these questions. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Right, thanks, thank everybody. You. Bye. 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 For Bye. me, it was wonderful, so I yes. really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Yes, goodbye, and thank you all. Thanks, Carlo.